factor in to do the normal stuff. And then during the director's report, I'll read some instructions that will help um, help the audience with with how the process is going to work. Okay, great. Welcome everyone to the Salt Lake City Planning Commission meeting of April 8th, 2020. Um, this is a new format for all of us. So please be uh, forgiving of any technical glitches as we get used to uh, being virtual here in the Planning Commission. Uh, the first item on our agenda is the approval of minutes for March 11th, 2020. Does anyone like to make a motion? I'll move approval. And I'll second that. Okay. Got a motion from Brenda and a second from Sarah. We'll do our roll call. Maureen? Yes. Amy? Yes. John? Yes. Matt? Yes. Brenda? Yes. Sarah? Yes. And Crystal. And yes. And abstain since. Yeah. <laughs> and abstain <laughs> probably makes more, more sense. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Motion passes. Uh, the next item on our agenda is a report of the chair and the vice chair. And other than adjusting to our new realities, I really don't have anything to report. How about you, Brenda? <laughs> Wait a second. Okay, then we will go on to the report of the director and Nick. Um, take it away. Okay, can everyone hear me? Just give me a thumbs up. I want to make sure. Okay, so I have on the screen some um, links that ev hopefully everybody can see uh, about how you can submit comments during the meeting. We will, everybody will have the opportunity um, to speak during the public hearing. So if you're, but first off, if you're having a hard time, you're watching on channel 17 or uh, on, on YouTube and you're having a hard time trying to get onto the WebEx meeting, on the screen is the address that you, uh, that will help guide you to connect. Um, if you need help, you can email us at planning.comments at slcgov.com. Those are, we're monitor, monitoring that, um, email address live, so we'll be able to see your comments and we have a number of staff members um, who get those comments who can help us troubleshoot and help make sure that any comments submitted are um, heard and read into the record. So just some tips when you log in, if you used your phone, you may want to use your phone for audio. It's a little bit more consistent of a connection and if you don't lose, uh, if we don't lose internet access, then uh, you can still hear everything. It also helps prevent some of the background echoing that happens. Um, in terms of submitting comments, for everybody who's logged into WebEx, we can see your name and how you joined, and we will give you, um, when we open that specific item that you're here to um, speak about, we will. you should be able to see a little icon towards the bottom of your screen that it looks like a little hand, it's usually on the panel side. You click that, it'll raise, it'll alert us that you have a comment. Um, and that way we'll know who's here to speak on what. If for whatever reason you can't find that and you wanna speak, send an email to the planning.comments at slcgov.com. And then uh, just saying, I wanna speak, but I can't figure out my, my hand and, and in the email, put your name so we know who it is, and that way we can make sure that everybody is given as best of opportunity as we possibly can to speak. Um, as normal, we obviously ask for all the comments to be respectful and to focus on the issue at hand. Um, speakers who are not being respectful may be muted, and um, you can submit the rest of your comments to that same planning.comments at slcgov.com. 
Uh, just like our normal meetings, recognized organizations will be given five minutes to make comments. Um, individual comments are limited to two minutes. When your two minutes are up, and this is really at, at your discretion, um, Commissioner Bell, on when you want me to cut them off, but we will mute people. So I think if, if you want to, I'll have a timer. If you want to, when hopefully you'll hear that timer, uh, but I can say time. <laughs> And at that point, if you want to let people know to wrap it up, they can, or you can direct me what you want me to do with the mute button. But the, we're, we're going to try to keep the commissioner's video feeds um, visible at all times. Staff members and others um, will probably not have their video on unless we're part of the discussion. So applicants will have about 10 minutes to make their presentation. And when it's their turn, I will move the hosts We'll move the applicant up to a uh, participant level so they can share their presentation, their screen, so everybody can see. Um, and just to clear, just to reiterate kind of the role of the Planning Commission, because we have two different types of items on the agenda tonight. We have legislative items and administrative items. The legislative items are those items where the city or where the Planning Commission is making a recommendation to the City Council and the city council is ultimately the decision maker. The other items are referred to as administrative items. Those are things like conditional uses or design review and plan developments, where the planning commission is the um, decision maker. And those decisions, um, are the, the role of the planning commission really is to make sure that all the standards are applicable standards are complied with and um, go from there. So. With that, um, unless anybody on the commission has any any questions, I'm going to go ahead and turn it back over to you, Adrian, so you can start the meeting. Would you like to introduce our newest planning commissioner? Oh, that's I I would. Um, Crystal, I'm actually going to let Crystal introduce herself. She kind of already did, but Crystal was appointed by the city council. Um, last night <laughs> so day one literally uh crystal do you want to introduce yourself i don't know if she's actually on anymore uh, she switched to be a panelist she flipped up into the panelist list but then she switched back into the attendee list i don't All know right, why let me, let me there we go crystal you're back into the panelist list. You want to introduce yourself? Sure. Can you hear me? We can. Great. Uh, I hope I, oh, my video. Here we go. I, I had to switch from my phone to my computer. But hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Crystal Young Otterstrom. I do know you already. Uh, and adore many of you, but uh, I professionally am the executive director of the Cultural Alliance, which works to advocate for and amplify the arts and humanities. So bring a little different voice, maybe. <laughs> and I'm just really thrilled to serve Salt Lake City and work with all of you to make our city even better than it already is. Great. Thank you, Crystal. Welcome. We're happy to have you join us. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and get started with the public hearing portion. So item number one on our agenda is the Rose Park Buddhist Temple conditional use at approximately 1185 West 1000 North. This is case number PLNPCM 2020-00078 and is Chrissy presenting? Yes, I see Chrissy's name up there. He oh. is. Can you hear me? I got it. We can. Let me move control over to you, Chrissy. Now you have control. You should anyway. Hey, can you see my screen? We can yeah. now. So this is a conditional use request for a place of worship in a single family zone for a property located at approximately 1185 West 1000 North. 
property is zoned R17000 single residential. The property was originally granted conditional use approval in 1996, but this request is required to be reviewed as a new conditional use due to a proposed renovation, which would increase the floor area by more than 25%. So I'm Chrissy, unable to hear Chrissy. Yeah, I can't hear her. Chrissy, can you um, try to adjust your microphone? Yeah, let me see what I can. There we go, that's way better. That's better? Yep. Okay, I will start over. So this is a conditional use request for a place of worship in a single family zone for a property located at approximately 1185 West, 1000 North. This is an R17000 zone. The property was originally granted conditional use approval in 1996, but it's required to go through a new conditional use because of they are proposing a renovation that would increase the floor area by more than 25%. Staff is recommending approval for this item. So the site currently contains an existing building which will be renovated to add a second story. Um, that second story will accommodate a, a grand hall office and other support spaces. I'll show you elevations for that on the next slide. Um, the hours of operation are expected to remain the same from about 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. And although they are increasing the floor area and adding a second story, um, they're not planning on having more seating for their congregation. So the um, seating on any given Sunday is expected to remain about 30 to 50 individuals. Um, additionally, there is uh, two residential units on site for one for a person that's there all the time and then one for a visiting clergy. Um, these are allowed through an, a past administrative interpretation. As far as neighborhood compa compatibility goes, um, the intended use of the renovation is actually to move events that are currently held outside indoors. So this would presumably reduce the impact on the neighborhood. Additionally, the site is bordered to the Northeast um, by the, Un the Unity Baptist Church and Rose Park Elementary School to the East and their track to the South. And there are single family homes on the north west corner and west but the uses surrounding the site are generally compatible with the use um, and it is an existing use that's just expanding um, this is the elevation that shows the second story that will be added um, the renovation includes was went through a special exception process over the summer of 2019 this was approved by staff as it can be approved at the administrative level um, the maximum height allowed in a R17000 zone is 28 feet, and they were proposing 31 feet 10 inches. This was approved um, due to the neighborhood compatibility that I mentioned before, where the elementary school to the east is currently 32 feet. So this was thought to be appropriate use and was approved in May 2019. So overall, as you can see in your staff report, this meets the standards of conditional use approval and complies with the criteria of detrimental effects. Um, so staff is recommending approval. We did not receive any public comments on this request. And that is the end of my presentation. Great, thank you, Chrissy. Um, any questions for Chrissy before we uh, open up the public hearing? You may want to see if the applicant has anything to add. To oh, sorry. Add. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all out of whack here. Yeah. The, <laughs> now we'll hear. So, okay. No questions for Chrissy right now? No. Okay. Then Maureen let's hear from the applicant. Up, I don't know if. Um, Maureen, do you have a question? No, I was just trying to get somebody's attention to get her. Um, oh, okay. So oh, I'm fine now. Yeah. It's just trying to keep me on track. That's all. Will you, Maureen, if you click on your hand, it'll, that same icon, it'll go down. There we go. All right. The applicant is um, Casey Lau. Casey, I've moved you to a panelist. If you have anything to add. If you have anything to add. Hello, could you hear me? Yes, we can. Um. Okay, yeah, uh, this is a KCL with the KCL design. I'm the architect for this project. Um, I thank you for Christy. You have a very good presentation. Um, and then uh, all the document is uh, 
uh, on uh, her kind of PowerPoint. And then uh, I just like to address, you know, the, the main purpose of this project is we try to increase the indoor space and then uh, which we can uh, have a host uh, event inside instead of outside. Um, so we can reduce the impact for the neighborhood. And then the reason we want to put a increased space on the existing building is uh, this building is very beautiful. And then uh, we really like to keep that. And then uh, we want to re also reduce the environmental impact for those uh, demolition uh, issue. So we we wish we can directly just put a uh, space on the existing building. Uh, so that's uh, all we have. <laughs> and then uh, I wish we can just uh, uh, can move forward on this project. That's it. Great, thank you very Great. much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions there from any the questions applicant from the commission? From the commission? Okay. Yeah. Okay, we'll now okay, open we'll up. We'll now open up the public hearing, the public but I'm hearing, getting some I'm getting feedback. Some feedback. All right, let's see if this works. Okay. Um, is there any, is there anyone, so I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone from the community council here who would like to speak? Okay, I have that as a no. <laughs> Nick, is there anyone, um, in general, who wishes to speak on this item? Uh, I'm, I'm guessing there probably is. Um, if those people could um, raise their hand, if you're here to speak on this item. I'm not seeing any hands go up. I'm not seeing that we've got any emails either. Okay. All right, seeing that there is no one who wants to speak, we will then close the public meeting and bring this back to the commission to see if there's any uh, discussion or questions for staff or the applicant from the commission. Okay, and I will see Looks if like anyone would Johnny be able to have their hands raised. Hey, this is John. I just wanted to mention, we've been testing that email address that you provided, Nick just using personal email addresses and we haven't gotten it to work. So I don't know if, if somebody is out there trying to provide a comment through email, I don't know that it's working. I'm wondering if maybe you could just use either my email address or Michaela's or yours instead. We want to broadcast that. Um, sure. I don't, I don't care who's, um, I don't know, John. Yours is is easy to sell to anybody. So I, I yeah, I agree. So if there's anybody that's on there, it's John dot Anderson. So J O H N dot A N D E R S O N at S L C G O V dot com. Okay, should we wait another minute or two for any emails to come in? Uh, yeah, let's give us a, a little bit. I'm going to have one of our staff people who's on um, test the raising their hand function too to make sure that's working. Yeah. 
Can we type John's address into the chat so people can actually see what it is? And I think I know it, but I don't want to get it wrong, so I'm not going to do it. Yeah, the Sarah's hand is raised, so that. Okay. All right. All right. Yep. All right. Yeah, the hand function's working. Um, so those staff members who did that, you can put it. You can put your hands down. Um, and I typed in the John's email address into the Q and A section for those that want to be able to see that. Great, thanks, Nick. Yeah, okay. So it's not looking like any hands are up. And John, have you received any emails? I mean, we can give it one more minute. Oh, uh, yeah, I haven't received anything. And I know that, um, as Chrissy kind of mentioned, they haven't received a lot of public input on the project either. So I don't think we were expecting a lot, but certainly we can be patient. I do have a hand that just came up. Um, Brian Hobbs, I'm going to unmute you and you'll have two minutes. Can you hear me, Nick? We can hear you now. All right. I I was I was actually not really interested in this portion of the agenda. I just wanted to raise my hand so you could see that it's working. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> For what That's great. Um, so we got I'll, it. I'll conclude my two minutes and turn it back over to you, Nick. How's that? <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you. And if if you could put your hand down, that would be great too. <laughs> All right, I'm still not okay. seeing any hands, so. Okay, okay. Um, I think I'll, I'll bring it back then to the commission for any discussion or questions, or if anyone is willing to entertain a motion. So I raised my hand, but I don't know that it's working for us. I'm I'm happy to make a motion. So please do. And who is this speaking? I can't oh, tell. Amy. Oh, thank you, Amy. Okay. Uh, motion. Okay. Based on the information in the staff report, the information presented, and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve petition PLN. PCM 2020-00078 with the following conditions. One, any modifications to the approved plans after the issuance of a building permit must be specifically requested by the applicant and approved by the planning division prior to execution. And two, the applicant shall comply with all other department division requirements. I'll second that. Okay. We have a motion by Amy. Was that a second by Brenda? Yep. Okay. Let's go down our roll call. Maureen. Yes. Amy. Yes. John. Yes. Matt. Yes. Brenda. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Crystal. Yes. Great. Motion passes. Okay. Moving on to agenda item number two, the LE plan development and preliminary plot at approximately 347, 353, and 359 North 700 West. These are case numbers 
PLNSUB 2019-00963 and PLNSUB 2020-00169. And our presentation will be from Casey first. All right, this is Casey. I assume somebody can hear me. Yeah, okay. I can hear you. Thank, you. Thank you. I'm going to try to share my screen. Okay, so this is a plan development and a preliminary subdivision plat uh, wrapped together. The address, the project is located on 700 West, uh, immediately west of the freeway uh, I-15. There are three vacant lots and the applicant seeks to combine those lots and develop it as a multifamily project. It would contain 24 units divided up into four different buildings. Um, so this first slide to kind of give you a sense of the vicinity. And I'll go to the next slide. Again, kind of a vicinity map looking to the west. The project is outlined in yellow. Here is a panoramic of the site, uh, currently vacant. To the right are some single family homes. To the left is a multifamily development. Here's the site plan. As you can see, there are four separate building footprints. Each, each footprint contains six units for a total of 24 units, and each unit would constitute its own lot as proposed by a preliminary plat. The setbacks um, are all in compliance with the zoning for an RM, RMF 35 zone. And let me state at this point that currently the property is zoned SR1, as you can see by this slide here over on the right side, highlighted in red. Property is currently zoned SR1 and is being considered by the city council to be changed to an RMF 35, which is residential multifamily 35 being the height limit. The council uh, was scheduled to take action on this last night. They postponed action on changing the zoning um, because of the difficulty in receiving public comment. So the zoning has not been changed at this time. Um, this proposal, this plan development would be subject to that zoning being changed. Going back to the site plan, uh, all the setbacks and building height are complied with. The building height is proposed at approximately 30 feet. Uh, the building height limit in the zone would be 35 feet. And the front setback, rear setbacks, and side setbacks uh, are all met. On the north side, there's a required landscape buffer, and the applicant is meeting that requirement of a 10-foot landscape buffer with trees and shrubs and fencing. Um, and you can see the trees on that north side. Here are the um, renderings of the building. You're looking at on the left side of that is the front uh, of the building that you would see from 700 West. The driveway would go down the middle and access garages on each of the buildings. Two car garages, three level units. And then down here on the right of your screen is, is a better straight on shot of the, of the proposed building, at least the front of it. Here's the preliminary plat drawings showing each unit to have its own lot. 
but none of the lots would front 700 West, uh, which is one of the requirements that is being modified through the plan development. The other standard being modified is that there are four buildings intended for this one larger lot, and the code currently requires one building per lot. Um, the applicant has tried to break up the building to allow for more green space and more light through the area. So with that, uh, staff determined that the project complies with the standards for plan development and recommends the project be approved with the conditions listed in the staff report, um, specifically subject to the, to the zoning change. Uh, so with that, I'll end my presentation. Great, thank you, Casey. Any questions for Casey at this point? I see Amy's raising her hand. So Casey, I have a couple of questions. How long ago did we see this one to, for the zone proposed recommendation? The zone change went to the Planning Commission um, in November, the first meeting in November. Okay. Um, so I have a question regarding uh, the, the changes we made, and I don't know if they're in effect yet, that gave um, planning staff the um, ability to approve certain uh, parts. I can't remember if it was for plan developments, but we talked a lot about um, direction to planning staff regarding that frontage of the main street. And do you, do you remember what I'm talking about? I, 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 are you really uh, specific project or projects in general? No, we had we had discussed in it and it was approved. It was like a general approval given to staff now to make approvals of some uh, aspects of projects so that they didn't come to the planning commission and one of the, the sticking points we talked about was if you had adequate um, direction in in writing about what would constitute approval from staff for street level frontage of like what what that building is looking like and i'm just wondering yeah. when that gets applied did you apply it or is it for something totally different and maybe nick can pipe in because I, I have this memory of us doing it, but I can't remember the full context of how it was approved or what projects it was applicable for. This is Nick and John Anderson might have some insight too. Yeah, um, I think you might be talking about the proposed changes to the RMF 30 zones that we discussed. Um, a few months ago, which would have allowed a lot of these things to be done by right rather than through a plan development. Um, so that was for the RMF 30 zones and it actually hasn't been to the council yet. So that wouldn't apply in this situation. Little memory job. So I guess one thing I'm curious, Casey, is did you work with the applicant regarding what this thing looks like on 7th West? Because um, I'm not too thrilled with its engagement and I don't know if you uh, tried to work with them and they didn't make changes or if you felt like it was meeting standards okay so they have made changes the process um they've added the, the balcony and the different materials uh to create more interest um so I, yes uh, staff was of the opinion that that the changes made were adequate uh, improved the design um, so we're still recommending approval. Any other questions yeah. for Casey? Casey, I have a, this is Matt, I have a question for you. Um, one of the standards that we're looking at is discusses whether the scale, mass, and intensity of the plan development is kind of compatible with the neighborhood. And one of the issues that I raised when we upzone this area was that question whether the upzone was compatible, but um, I was overruled, uh, I think, clearly in that sort of discussion. Um, but to me, I mean, the rest of the zone seems to be much smaller than RMF 35 in general. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe dive a little bit deeper in your understanding, and maybe you and I um, 
about why you feel that this mass scale and intensity matches the character of the neighborhood, particularly the surrounding parcels that are uh, zoned R, you know, RMF 25 or and, uh, and the lower zones kind of around it. And how to really also also really how to consider a zone that or project that's that's been you know in a in what has been a, a more intense zone, even though the neighboring zones are less intense. How you kind of have dealt with that mass and scale question. So really, it, it's coming down to the the potential that this is going to change to RMF forty five, uh, which was zoned that way previously, uh, approximately twenty years ago. Uh, the property to the south of it is zoned RMF 35 and has existing um, uh, multifamily projects of about a similar height uh, on it. This meets all the requirements for RMF 35. So it, it's really kind of assumed that if this zoning does change to RMF 35, then the dimensional requirements that are allowed by that zone would, uh, would be compatible. Uh, so, so that the question is really answered at, at that point. Um, so, if this does get changed to RMF 35, then and this meets all the dimensional requirements, it, it's assumed that it's it's compatible size-wise. Um, now, relating to the properties to the north that are zoned um, single-family, yeah, that there's a question there that this would definitely uh, mass-wise uh, is bigger. Um, the height is similar. A single family zone is allowed a building height of 28 feet, uh, posed at approximately 30 feet, just less than 30 feet. Um, although granted, 28 feet is a pitched roof, where this is a flat roof. So uh, yes, there, there would be more mass, but that is where the landscape buffer comes in. The code requires a 10 foot landscape buffer when you are up against a single family or residential type zone. Um, with trees spaced so many feet, uh, fencing um, to allow for that increased distance and reduce the impact to them. So the code itself tries to work with that um, and, and staff felt like the applicant has, has attempted to do that and comply with the code. Um, so that, that's it. So for, for staff, we're not modifying the height restrictions and the massing restrictions then we're mainly just modifying doing the subdivision and the kind of street facing stuff we have all these yeah, standards that are listed in you know four plan developments you know attachment g in our staff report and i'm just i'm wondering though how how to interpret those if they if they comply outright with the underlying zone do we consider whether the standard or not applies when approving a, do we only consider the standard that's being modified, um, you know, by when seeking a plan development, or we consider all the standards that are normally considered when reviewing a plan development? Like, does that question make sense? I, I think so, yes. Yeah. So when someone applies for a plan development, it opens up the project to uh, review against all the standards that are applicable, which there are plan development standards. So. Yeah, in the staff report, I go through those, uh, I address those, um, but you're right, it's, it's, it's subject to all those standards. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, uh, any other questions for Casey? Yeah, this, this is John. Um, I'm just curious about this street facing facade is can you take us through that process a little bit of the approval of that? Is, is it something that, that we're requiring to create this amount of busyness on one facade that's so small just because it's applied to such a small building? Or is it is it more of a architect's choice to, to add so much to the facade? I'm not sure. If if you want me to respond to that now, or if you want the applicant to make the presentation, John is one of the applicants, and I can respond later. Or John, is the question whether city staff directed the applicant to um, add additional design elements to the facade to increase engagement with the street? 
That's that's my where I was headed with the question, yeah. but I'm I, I do see this a lot on these smaller facades where we're trying to put uh, standards from much larger buildings onto smaller facades, and then it creates a bit of a nightmare of a facade. So um, after the second presentation, we can return to this question. That's fine. I also have this question. Okay. I agree with John on this particular issue. Like we'd like to explore this more. Okay. And any other questions for Casey at this point? All right. I've scrolled through my video feed. I'm not seeing any others. Okay. Thank you, Casey. Um, we'd like to hear now from the applicant. Do you guys hear me? Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Um, quick question. Sorry for the technical question, but how can I share my screen? Is there a way? Is this John? Yeah, it is. Okay, John, I just gave you control. Okay. Um, so on the top of your screen in the menu bar, uh -huh. there should, there's a, a tab called share. Perfect. Okay. There we go. You guys see that? Okay. Yeah. All right. So here, let me let me first just before I get into this, let me address the street facing um, facade um, with you guys. So going through this, I, I think. A lot of you are probably fairly familiar with some of our other developments downtown. Um, we definitely push a more modern aesthetic. Um, we are ones that I know that for some people, stucco is a four letter word. Um, we actually like stucco for its cleanliness and uh, modern aesthetic. Um, before this, we actually had a lot more um, stucco on the street facing and through working with staff uh, they wanted us to push a little bit more uh, durable materials hence where we brought in the um, lap siding um, the, the black lap siding so here's kind of a call out of all the, the materials um, you know we're we're open to cleaning this up and making it a little bit more um, sophisticated um, we we would personally like to maybe make it more simplified. Um, the things that we really wanted to focus on was the porch on the grade that, so that you're on the same eye level as passerbys that are walking down the street. And we also wanted to where that level two balcony is, that is the main living space, the kitchen, living, dining area. So, you know, and then we added a lot of other windows. So, you know, we, we are open to working with you guys on that. Hanging out on the front lawn, and they're all like three feet apart from each other. I'm sorry, what was that? Um, I think someone might just be unmuted, but I would just uh, go ahead and do the rest of the presentation, and we'll return to questions at the end. Okay, sounds good. So, um, as you can see, we've, um, you know, looking at this um, site, when we started looking through, you know, this parcel land being uh, changed to RMF 35 to match the existing zoning of the apartment complex to the south, um, you know, we're, we're essentially, um, you know, predominantly the site is surrounded by RMF 35. So that's why we felt like there was a justification to um rezone this to rmf 35. Um, we started looking at you know if we were following following the strict um, rmf 35 multifamily guidelines um, we could essentially build two buildings like i'm showing with a uh, drive aisle down the center with tuck under um uh, car parking um, doing so would make it so that your only pedestrian interaction would be facing 700 west where tenants would either 
go into an internal corridor from the tuck under parking or come into the building straight from 7th West. Um, if we maxed out the site footprint to um, the 10 foot side yards, um, it would make it so that the, the small green space in the rear could probably only be um, uh, accessed through the building. So we would essentially be cutting up the site and which would reduce in less pedestrian interaction. Um, so we wanted to look at, um, you know, splitting this up into four separate buildings and um, from our from our Alta survey, um, calculating uh, the the max density per this zone, which is 30 units per acre. Um, we're at 0.94 acres, so we could go up to 28 units. However, um, you know, we are looking at this being a for sale project where we want to we want to provide home ownership in this area. And in doing so, we want to focus more on the site quality in versus trying to put in as many units as possible. So we reduced down to 24 units to provide a larger landscape buffer on the side yards where the front doors are, as well as provide a larger green space in the rear of the, the property. So that uh, these, you know, we kind of have a tagline, we try to create communities within communities. We wanted to create just a small green space slash pocket park for these tenants with a, a decent sized um, side yard that can pull them through um, by the front doors to, to pull pedestrian activity back into the site. Um, and so in doing that, um, you know, I want to thank Casey. Casey was great to work with. Um, you know, we, we, we pushed back, back and forth, but he was, he was great. His attention to detail and um, patience with us was, was great. Um, you know, we going through this, you know, work with him, He's, he mentioned a lot of the items, you know, discussed that we only needed to do a 10 foot landscape buffer along the north, but we wanted to push that to 12, 12 feet. Um, we always install um, more mature trees than the, the code asked for, and we wanted to have great site circulation so that as people, even though you're walking off the street, we wanted to uh, push that pedestrian interaction throughout the entire site so that the entire site was activated instead of just the front yard setback. Um, also, as you can see here um, along on the right hand side, those street facing units that I kind of started with, they do have an on grade patio so that people can sit out there, interact with passerbys that are walking just by the side on the public sidewalk. You know, we, we uh, believe strongly in eyes on the street and we try to do that and we try to really up that by giving eyes on every part of the site. Um, and as you can see, breaking up the building and reducing unit count, our building pad is only 40% of the site where we could have gone up to 60%. And I mentioned that we're only, we're only proposing 24 units instead of um, 28. Um, here's a couple other renderings. Um, we kind of addressed the one on the, the left. Uh, that's the street facing unit um, and also as you walk down this um, the, the side yards where the front doors are we we look at fully landscaping these with trees and perennials that are drought tolerant as well as uh, grass so that there is a green belt that surrounds this development to just kind of spark that pedestrian activity and that that's kind of all i have so um let me know if you have any questions Great, thank you. We have questions for the applicant. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so concerning your green space in the front yard that you're talking about here in the front setback, um, there is a tree lawn, then there's a sidewalk, then there's a large sort of front setback. So what, we don't really have a landscape plan that shows what you're doing with that. We just, we do have some indication of trees on a, on in the front yard setback, but you, but that's not what you showed in the rendering just now. So, um, how do we know what we're getting? So we are, we hid the trees in the front just so you could actually see the building. <laughs> but we are planning per the the drawings in your staff report. There will be four trees installed in the front yard. So, in the front yard we, but not in the tree lawn. Uh, no, it, it'd be it would be within the front yard setback. 
So can we get some trees in the tree lawn too? Because this, this street has a quality of having uh, trees along it pretty thickly. So um, on it, I know that your property now, the trees are not um, healthy. I, I was out there. To, uh, yeah. So, um, so sort of reviving the, the tree lawn trees um, as a and, part of a neighborhood. And Brenda, I, I just want to make sure I've, I'm 100% um, understanding. When you say tree lawn, you mean the park strip? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Some people call it tree lawn. Some people call it park strip. No, got, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure. So, would you, um, would you propose we move these four trees into the tree lawn, or do trees in addition to these trees in the front? Yard? I like to see trees in in addition, so you could then do smaller trees within the front yard, uh, or either way, whichever way seems to work better. But um, I know I, even in the apartment next door, which is uh, apartment complex next door, which is not, uh, um, you know, for sale. It's a more affordable um, unit. There are very mature trees, which make the project look really, you know, much um, more human. So that's an important part of it. Yeah, I agree. And as you, you since you went to the site, you could see that there was uh, a lot of trees on site. We have done through our survey, we have done a thorough inventory of the trees. And so, you know, trees that can be, they're all pretty overgrown. And so we do have a, a plan that if there's trees we can keep and prune back to make them healthy again, we will plan on doing that. Um, the other question I have for you regarding landscape is, uh, the rear um, landscape area, you de you've decided not to do anything but just turf back there? No trees, no nothing? We, you know, based off our experience with our past developments that we've had, um, we have put, we have programmed those out quite a bit more. And through cell surveys and talking to people that have now been living there for over a year plus, people... Uh, love their animals, especially their dogs. And they have asked us, like, we wish this would just be more wide open so that we could, you know, either our kids can play back there or our dogs. And so right now, in a way, it is a little unprogrammed space um, that could be kind of multi-purpose with how the residents would like to use it. Okay, thank you. So Thanks, then Brenda. Any other questions for the applicant? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump back in with the, uh, the facade. Okay. Um, I think your pr presentation uh, came down, but I'm looking at one of the elevations. Um, Here, I can put it back up if you'd like. That might be easier. Um, that way everyone can see. So that part of my question is how much of this is Kind of what your intent was versus how much of this is our standards for the, the city because i'll be honest I'm, i am an architect as well i'm a, a more contemporary architect and some i've had similar instances where I try to do a simple elegant building and then it ends up with a lot of things that were unintended so i'd like to know more about what the goal was and then where we ended up yeah like i there was a little bit of that, like I can understand. So one thing here, um, we are striving to make this and a, you know, a, a good affordable um, project um, that, that kind of matches the, the home values of the area. Um, there was a comment by um, staff that they didn't want to see any stucco that faced the street. Um, and we just said, you know, we, like I kind of started with, we we don't, when we use stucco, we don't use it to say we want to save money. We use it um, intentionally because we do like the modern aesthetic. Um, we do understand that there is a little bit of a stigma for it. Um, and so kind of a middle ground working with staff is I said, we kind of went to them and said, look, we want to keep it predominantly the filled material stucco. But what if we incorporated these bands of um, smooth lap siding to give a little bit more uh, haptic interest to the street facing facade? And so it, it, was, it was a little bit of a, a compromise from all parties, I'd say. Um, so that's kind of how we 
ended where we we did. Okay. So, so basically, the idea, the the changes that um, um, you did were to uh, add another kind of uh, material to the to the project in response to the plan the planners. Is that yes, correct. Because otherwise, the the you 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 added what uh, the the um, fiber cement lap siding where before you had um, stucco or ephus? Yeah, that's correct. And okay, so, so the black, what's black in this rendering is that lap siding and that would have been white or would have just been painted black? Uh, it would have been white, but through changing to make this work, we ended up tweaking the facade more to make it feel a little bit more intentional versus just tacking it on. So it's hard to say the previous rendition was this minus the lap siding. Yes. So, um, I understand how things change. Yes. Yeah, because you're, you're an architect. So <laughs> it's for simplicity, I'll answer saying yes, but it wasn't quite that simple. Okay. I, and on my end, I think um, what I don't like to see on smaller facades is so many changes in material and changes in, in kind of the in and out. This floating rectangle, I think, is probably my bigger concern. If that was grounded some way where maybe that whole gray area came to the ground and maybe created a portal or some way of entry, but didn't feel like it was floating and then adding everything underneath, which I think is just kind of chopped up and, and a little distracting. Um, maybe even adding the black to the bottom to add some weight to it. I just feel like that floating element just, it feels a little tacked on to me. Um, okay. So I just wasn't sure where that came from, if that was an original part of the intent or if that was something we had to add to get that five foot relief that I know that we have to do in certain zones. It. I agree with John. I think that, that there's just too much going on here. I mean, um, I think that's maybe also true on the side, on the what we're calling the front facade, which is kind of a, a funky little, uh, a funky little facade too, where um, there just seems to be a lot of it. It's you know striped in a vertical fashion, which I don't, I don't, I still don't understand that tendency um, um and again three different materials four different materials is just a little bit too much for uh for a project like this so in, especially in the front facade I, I, and i i can jump back in i mean i think even that front facade if you were to go back to the stucco and get rid of that l and then if you were to make the black or that uh, kind of floating rectangle black that came all the way down, that would feel more grounded to me and more intentional. Um, you could keep the same form roughly, but I think just kind of grounding that more and doing two materials instead of three might clean it up a little bit. Um, I don't know what your thoughts, if you guys tried that. Um, yeah, we would, we would welcome the, the kind of permission to simplify it a little bit and kind of refine the material palette, if you will. Yeah, um, I, yeah. yeah. We'd like to. Because I, I agree with you. I think stucco done well is really great. Stucco done poorly is, is really awful. So, you know, if you can keep the level of finish where it needs to be for it to be correct, then I think that that's, that's more acceptable to me personally. But, um, I just, I think that would be more of a trade off that I would be willing to make versus just adding more materials just, just because. I, I would say like, we need to simplify it. I'm not, I wouldn't, you know, give any specifics there. I would actually tend to bring the, the panels, the fiber cement panels down to the ground instead of having stucco there. So you know, whichever way you want to go, you know, whatever. 
But yeah, no, whatever, I, whatever simplification you can do to this, it's just a little too busy for the front street front right now for this for this for this kind of a project. Where we're seeing a lot of busyness, I guess that's why John and I are asking, you know, if this is something that's an architectural trend we're missing, or is it just, or it's something that's being, that's that's coming out of our guidelines. Yeah, because uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I I think you know I um i think i can see a little bit of it's coming from guidelines i think you know i think staff is um they're they're following the guidelines and i know that in a lot of your zones um stucco is very frowned upon and so i think when they see a predominantly dominant stucco facade that it kind of throws up red flags for them so i can when they're when they're viewing it under the context of some of the zoning ordinance i can understand that um so a little bit, you know, I'd say a lot of the busyness is kind of driven by that, uh, you know, trying to kind of meet in the middle, because I, I agree, we tend to like to do things a little bit more simplified and sophisticated instead of throw multiple materials at it. So we, okay. we would welcome the idea of kind of simplifying, um, doing as Jonathan says, doing stuff well, um, and kind of, readdress these a few of these facades um one one more comment for for these two renderings you have open um because another another way to simplify it would be maybe getting rid of the stucco that's underneath the l shape and to the side of the l shape and keeping the stucco more like it is on the, the right image where it's more of a border yep that, that might be another way to simplify and, and maybe even just bringing that doing that and bringing that gray panel to the ground um I don't, like I don't have specific options, but I, I, I think just looking at it briefly, those types of things could make a difference. Um, I would also ask the same question on the right image. Is there a reason there's three materials inside each one of those portals that you've created? Um, is that a standard that you're following or is that a design decision? No, that, that was just um, to add a little bit more depth to the, to the facade. But okay. they, they, we could simplify it down to, to two materials. These are with, just the, with, with just the stucco surround. Because I can almost see like those surrounds being a, like a way to, to change material versus it just happening inside so many times. Um, yeah. Because just being black and white, you know, that it's, it's like I say, it's tricky, but I just think simplifying is, is usually better. Uh, when it comes to design, I completely agree. So, okay. Well, thank okay. thank you for the insight. I appreciate it. Any other comments or questions for the applicant? Okay. Not seeing any. So, thank you for your presentation and the discussion. Um, next, Chairman we'll Bell, move this on. Is Casey. Yes. I just wanted to clarify, oh, there were a couple of questions brought up. Uh, Commissioner Shear asked about the trees. Uh, the plans show four trees in the park strip. Um, so, they do? Uh, yes, so the four trees that are that. shown. What page is that on in the staff report? Do you know, Casey? Uh, looking here. Sorry. Because I do see a site plan, but it doesn't even go out to the street edge. It just goes to the back of sidewalk. Page 10 and 11 are the tree, tree plan. Okay, there's page 10. Okay, oh, I see. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you, that's helpful. Okay. okay. And then I just wanna, um, as far as a reference on the changes throughout the, the design changes on the front, I'm just going to put up what was originally submitted so you can kind of see uh, the, the transition. Um, and all the stuc stucco was a concern, it wasn't the main concern, it was more trying to engage that, that corner or that the facade. Um, yeah. So let's see let's here. Look. 
Oh, I'm not a participant, so I can't share my screen, uh, but I'll, I'll do that maybe later or go ahead and carry on. Okay, so maybe after the, the public comment portion, we'll come back to the, the facades. Yeah, yeah let's okay. do that. I want to hear from the public okay. anyway. Okay. This may not be a we big issue. Now, yeah, so we'll now move on to the public comments um portion of the meeting a couple of, of points i'd like to make before we start just to reiterate what casey mentioned during his report um, we're here tonight to evaluate the plan development application on the subdivision plot and our focus in evaluating those proposals is to consider the um the the standards that are in, in the staff report and in the code, um, and those standards speak to such issues as consistency with the city's adopted policies and plans and compatibility in terms of height and density and setbacks and landscaping with the surrounding area. Um, the city council obviously has discretion when making a decision whether to approve or deny a rezoning petition. Um, they have a lot more discretion to make that decision, and that's not what's before us tonight. So I just want to reiterate that point and to ask that um, or suggest that, you know, comments that speak to the issues that are before us are the most helpful uh, when we're formulating our um, discussion and our decision on these two applications. Um, and I, I just wanted to uh, point that out again before we go to the, the public hearing portion of, um, of the meeting tonight. So I'll open the public hearing. Um, and first I'll ask to see if there's anyone here from the community council who would like to speak. Just to remind folks, if you do want to speak, raise your hand uh, digitally. There's uh, an icon in the program that allows you to uh, indicate that you want to speak. You can also type in that you want to speak into the Q&A section as well. And, and just so everyone knows, we do have that email address up and working at this point. So if you want to send comments to um, planning.comments at slcgov.com, it works as well. Great. Okay. So are, is no one here from uh, the community council that we can tell? It does not look like anybody has indicated that they wish to speak on them on this item. Okay. Um, and and there are no individuals who wish to speak. Is that correct? It does not appear to be that way. There is one attendee that's got a Thomas Rivera's a question somehow. You seeing that? Is it just me seeing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there is a question. He did ask a question. Well, he made a comment about the project looking pretty cheap. I asked him if he wanted to speak on it, and he said no. Okay. Um. And. There's no one who wishes to speak. I will now close the public meeting and bring this back to the commission for discussion. Um, so there's also all these look. people in the channel, the attendee list that have exclamation marks by their name. What's that mean? Oh, attentiveness, if they're paying attention. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say, I don't know if you really want to know what it means. I think it just means that there are that their computer's been idle. So they're probably just sitting and watching and they haven't done anything else. Got it. All right. Thanks. Sorry, everybody. No, thank you. 
Um, we can go back to uh, Casey and perhaps we can walk through the facades and the changes from the original plan to the current proposal. Casey, I've given you the ability to share your screen again. Okay. So this is uh, down on the left, you'll see what the, the original plan was. Um, so there was some concern about stucco, but also kind of a concern about just adding more uh, features to it. So the, the as you can tell, the applicant added the, the balcony, uh, a front entrance there. Um, we we did get to the point where it is now with those multiple materials, um, trying to um, increase the the interest, um, and, and maybe that that was too far. But just kind of to give you a sense of of where we've come from. That's so, not that's the yeah. wrong facade. As I say, that that's a completely blank facade. Is that? That's the garage facade. We need we'd like to see the front facade. So th there it is on the rendering. Uh, still the road. Yeah, that's the back. Yeah, that's the back. That's the back. Oh, oh, yeah, it's just white. It's nothing. So uh, th this is the front um, originally. OK, so they didn't have any front facing facade. Right, so we're trying trying to work with that to improve that. Well, you you did that. That's a big improvement. I must yeah. Say. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll, uh, yeah. Yeah. If we could just find somewhere in the middle, um, I think we'd be in a good spot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm. Um, okay. Uh, I have another okay. question for you. I'm sorry, uh, Casey, which is uh, the police department report asks for um, for uh, specific kinds of fencing along the sides of the property in particular. And um, and maybe the back as well. Um, um, and also um, they're concerned about the gap between the two buildings because there's no windows. I would be concerned about that as well, for safety reasons and also for design reasons, but certainly for safety reasons, the gap between the two buildings, there should be some windows if there are not uh, on that facade. And and that uh, is kind of a, a requirement, uh, well, not a requirement, but there were suggestions from the police department. Uh, so those certainly could be made a condition if the commission saw fit to do that. Um, and is and, there enough space between the two buildings to do that? Because you have to have a minimum of, John, what is it, eight feet to be able to do that? Yeah, I think it's a fire hazard issue having windows that close. So yeah, there, we have to check that requirement and make sure they're far enough apart. So I get, this is the John with Steve Irvin. So they're 10 feet apart, so we can have some openness. And we yeah. do have, we do have some windows there. We have the top and bottom of the stairs. So there's actually quite a bit of um, view down in about 10 foot. Okay, highway. that's good. That's good. We just weren't seeing that. So that's good. Well, maybe we were, missed it. I think it's on page 16 of the staff report. It looks like that's the elevation that of the side yard. I'm reading it right. In yeah. between the the buildings. Yeah, it looks And correct. then you can kind of see it up on 14. You can see the upper story windows. So, okay. Um, okay. Oh, yeah, you're right. There are other. Page 16, right. You see it, back? You see yep. it there? Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. And, and also, I am also concerned about the, the fencing on the side because we're talking about um, that. The, for whatever reason, and I'm suspecting it's because of the narrowness of the lot, having those units have their front entrance facing the side, facing a fairly narrow, even though it's not as narrow as it, you know, 
uh, could have been. It's still a fairly narrow side yard of only 12 feet. Um, which means the quality of that fencing is really what you're going to be sort of, that's going to, that's going to define the, that quality of that space. So are you plant, I mean, you do have landscaping there and you have, so what's, what is the fence and material and assuming you are going to build a fence there? Um, we're planning on doing, it's, it's kind of noted there, it's a six foot privacy fence that will run along the, the, the side yards and the rear yard. Okay, so the police department is asking for that fence not to be so, to, to have some transparency so that whatever is happening in the vacant lots next door, and maybe they're referring to the rear yard as vacant. Don't know. It doesn't look like anything is vacant next door. Yeah, I think we're filling up the rest of the vacant space I, I think the north lots are residential and that might be where they want to create yeah. separation so yeah, you're not looking into people's are, backyard. Are, are people's backyards so yeah okay all right in which case a privacy fence would probably be more appropriate i also um yeah. if i may i want to note for the discussion of the planning commission that there was a Petition signed by many, many people on this project against this project, uh, which I assume is one of the reasons why the city council made the decision to to table this discussion until people could arrive. Just I just want to make sure everybody saw that in terms of the consideration. And I know um, not being affordable sometimes is a uh, there's a lot of things that people say when they say this project is too, when they really want to say this project is too dense for our neighborhood. So I don't know. And the commission should know that the, uh, that the, um, our, what's before us is subject to the approval of the rezone. So if the city council approves the rezone and if we approve the applications before us, then they would be approved. If the city council elects not to approve the rezone, then um, even if we approve this tonight, it would have no effect as that's a condition to our approval or a condition precedent to our approval. Madam so, Chair, okay, this, is, this is Nick. Can I make a, a quick comment? Sure. Um, so we did receive um, two emails that came in after your planning commissions were listed and made public, or planning staff reports were made um, public. Mm -hmm. And I just want to, because the public hasn't seen those or heard those, I just wanted to read those into the record. Um, That'd be great. Quick. Thanks. This first email is from an Elizabeth Estrada Murillo. It says, uh, hello, I'm a current resident of Rose Park and have been for the last 10 plus years. I have seen my peers, friends, and loved ones being displaced by the long-term effect of redlining and what has developed to gentrification. Rent will be raised if this development plan continues and low-income folks will be displaced. What we need is affordable housing. Please take the folks that have been living here or living there for years into consideration. And then the other comment received was from a Daniel Sutherland uh, who wrote, I urge you to stop development that hurts Rose Park residents in uh, parentheses Ely and in, or Ely, however you say that, and instead invest more into affordable housing. And that's it. All right. Thank you, Nick. This is John, the presenter. Can I respond to those or do you guys need to chat for Uh, I, I think we'll discuss among the commission, and if we have any additional questions, we can reach back out. Um, is there any other discussion among uh, the commissioners? Any other issues you want to address? Questions we need to ask? Thoughts you want to share? I'm ready Sarah. to make a motion. But I'm a little nervous doing that since I think Brenda and John might have some um, 
conditions. And so I'm ready. You know, do you guys want me to do it? And then you guys can kind of help add your conditions. Or do you want to let me know what conditions you want to add? And then I'll make the motion. Or do you guys want to just make the motion? I think we still need to hold a public hearing. Oh, I thought we did that. We, we, we held the public hearing. <laughs> we we talked about how many people were on unattentive <laughs> when I looked at that. <laughs> <up. laughs> so to recap, the, the comments from, from Brenda and John had to do with the street facing facade and the recommendation that uh, the applicant simplified the material list and refined the facade design per, you know, the discussion held during the planning commission hearing. Is there more to it than that? No, I don't, I don't think we should be more specific than that. I think that's, that does it. And, and have staff review and, you know, uh, make the final determination. Yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think, you know, there's, as, as long as it gets simplified and cleaned up a little bit uh, to, to reduce the number of materials, I think we would all be happy with that. So if I just okay. say we, uh, to have the project simplify its uh, materials as approved by staff. Is that, will that be a, f a fine condition? For you guys? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. And I'm going to make a, if I can find on my computer where my notes went. And why, why you're looking for those, I mean, my, um, am I the only one that has a issue with, with C, the scale, mass, and intensity of the development being compatible with the neighborhood? Sounds like it. So, is your concern, <laughs> there, is your concern, Matt, with the with the adjacent residential, the single family? Yeah, to I mean, the this, north? I mean, when this went through the zoning, I think I was also the, the lone no vote. I mean, I actually like CW and I think they've done. I like a lot of the projects they do. Um, I was, I didn't really support the rezone. I felt like there was always this need to have kind of a breakdown uh, between the single family residents and these more higher intensity stuff. Otherwise, we're just going to be rezoning that whole area to RMF 35. And I was overruled there. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's the way it goes. Uh, six to one, because I looked up the meeting minutes, so I didn't, it wasn't even close. <laughs> so, like, so I know I'm falling on a, uh, on a sword here, but, um, but I, I, I just, I mean, again, I still feel like you have those residential properties, I think. You know, we, we rezoned it to allow for a higher intense use. I mean, and that the rezone clearly has come through. The well, just to clarify, the, the rezoning is pending. It's not yet been right. approved. So. Right. And right. I, I, would, I would just throw out that, you know, the center of the, the, the block really is a higher density. And those three lots are such an odd shape. It would be very difficult to break that into something reasonable for someone to use or to purchase. And so I do think it's a good use for the site as it stands. Um, I, you know, we do need more density in our city. We have a housing shortage and you would think if we were to build enough housing that that would reduce the price of housing um, because people have to go someplace. Um, so I find it reasonable that it does square off that zone fairly cleanly and it creates a place where we can actually use this lot instead of having it be abandoned and untaken care of, um, which I think is more of an eyesore. It's not like it's a park or anything useful. Yeah. I, I agree there's an eyesore for sure. Okay. All right. Since we've shut Matt down, I'm going to make a <laughs> motion. Um, based on the information, the staff report, the information presented in the info input received during the public hearing i move that the commission approve the le plan development pln sub 2019-00963 and let's see i think i'm doing the wrong one hang on i'm almost close um and preliminary subdivision plat pln sub 2020-00169 with the following conditions 
we ask that they simplify the materials on the outside and uh, we want all of that to be approved by staff. Sarah, this is Paul. Can you uh, be a little more specific on simplify the materials on the outside? No, I cannot. But maybe uh, we can get some insights from the architects who have strong opinions on this. Um, my, my opinion is if we could reduce the way that it's broken up, where you have stucco, cement board, stucco, cement board, and then underneath that cement board and more stucco, that's just a lot of transitioning. If you could go stucco, cement board, and then that gray cement board all the way to the ground, that's an option. I think there's a lot of solutions, um, just reducing the busyness of it, um, even mimicking the, the stucco portals that are on the sides on the front and then having the infill be something some, some more simplified. Um, that's kind of what, I'm getting at when I say simplify. I don't know if that helps you. Um, what if we say so in simplify? In terms of the motion, can, can we go with the language I had originally, simplify the material list and refine the facade design per the comments provided from the commission during the planning commission hearing with final approval delegated to staff? Paul, does that work? Yeah, sorry. I was watching Brenda talk with her microphone off. I don't know if she was trying to say something. <laughs> Maybe she was just muttering at me. I don't know. <laughs> I like it. What, that's, that's what, what Adrian said is, I think, appropriate and certainly interpretable because the, the applicant can go back and listen to the comments. Right. Okay, that, that's that's fine. We have some stuff. That worked, Paul. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Now we need a okay. second. Yeah, we've got a motion by Sarah. I'll second. Second. <laughs> second by Brenda. Okay, we'll start. We will go reverse order. Crystal. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Brenda. Yes. Matt. No. John. Yes. Amy. Yes. Maureen. Yes. Okay, motion passes six to one. Is that right? Yeah, that is right. Okay. Thank you all. Next item on the agenda is um, the Salt Lake Crossing Design Review at approximately 470 West 200 North, case number PLN PCM 2019-01106. And Brenda will take over as I am recusing myself due to a potential conflict of interest. I, I also need to recuse myself for a potential conflict of interest as well. Does that leave us with a quorum, Nick? Let's see, let me count faces here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We lose two, that leaves us six. We have 11 appointed commissioners, so we still have a quorum. Terrific. So this, is, this, uh, this item will be um, presented by Nanette. That's right. And I am sharing my screen. All right, are you able to see my presentation? Yes. Great. So the applicant with SALT development is requesting a design review to allow for modification to design standards for their Salt Lake Crossing project. The project is a proposed mixed use development, which will include 150 micro and 150 studio uh, residential units with co-working space a gym, a clubhouse, and a coffee shop located on the ground floor. The project site is located at 
470 West, 200 North in the TSA UCC zoning district and has two frontages along two public streets on 200 North and 490 West. While pedestrian use is limited in the area presently, the project site is also in an area that's developing for increased pedestrian use. Originally, the project came in as a TSA development score review. The Salt Lake Crossing project met the criteria for an administrative review, but it was found by staff to not meet the required design guidelines along the 490 West frontage in the TSA zoning district. The Planning Commission previously heard this request on February 26th and provided to the applicant and staff direction on the design review. The design review requested modifications are shown on the presentation um, and includes the modification to the maximum length of a building facade facing a public street, modification to the required amount of active ground floor uses, and the amount, the amount of visual interest along the front frontage, modification to the amount of ground floor glass, and a modification to the number of building entrances along 490 West. The first design modification proposed by the applicant is the maximum length of the building facade on 490 West. The design standard allows a maximum width of 200 feet. The requested modification is for a 450 foot building length. The purpose of creating a maximum building facade length is to break up large expanses of building. While the facade length exceeds the maximum length um, of the, of the design standard, it's staff's opinion that the project meets the intent in that the vertical col columns, um, in between the vertical columns is an open courtyard, which will break up the expanse of the building. The active ground floor use and visual interest is also being requested to be modified. The design standard requires that at least 60% of the ground floor use is an active use other than parking. This active use must extend 25 feet into the building. This standard also requires that the ground floor provide at least 25% visual interest. The Salt Lake Crossing project is proposing 18% active ground floor use, and it will enhance visual interest by providing space for art displays. Um, near the entrances to the building along 490 West. Salt Development has been working with local and youth artists in occupying these art display spaces. The project will also provide green walls and seating areas along 490 West. In February, Planning Commission heard a work session of this project to direct planning staff and the applicant on the design of the project. One of the topics of discussion and an overall concern with the design of these green walls. The applicant um, has addressed this concern by increasing the depth of these green walls by three feet. The applicant is also requesting a modification to the ground floor glass with a proposed 32% of ground floor glass. The majority of this glass houses the art displays along 490 West. The final request is to allow for a modification to building entrances. The requirement is a one building entrance for every 40 feet of frontage. The proposed is um, the proposal is for 80 feet in between each building entrance. The placement of these building entrances is uh, staff feels is appropriate as it connects the design of the upper floors to the building of the building to the ground floor. Further, the modification to the glass standard is also considered appropriate as the fenestration provided on the building provides for a visual interest and is positioned toward, toward the pedestrian. So it's staff's opinion that overall the project meets the intent of the zoning district and the design review standards of the TSA UCC zoning district and staff is recommending approval of the design review for Salt Lake Crossing with the four conditions listed in the staff report. And that is the end of my presentation for Salt Lake Crossing.
Hey, Brenda, it looked like you might have been saying something and you were on mute. Yeah, okay. So is the applicant here? And can we give control of the meeting to the applicant? Uh, we, we are here. This is Ethan. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Now to answer your second question, let's try. Ethan, there we go. All right. Hey, that worked. I think. Yep. All right. You're seeing this? Yes, we see it. All right. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be brief on, on part of this since I know you're somewhat familiar with the project given our, our working session last month or in, in uh, February. And uh, just, just looking at hardware district, if I can just change. This, this is just context of the neighborhood. Our project being the, this in the, in the corner here, some of the other apartment buildings that we put it around. So, you know, we know our neighbors decently here. Um, we're, we're trying hard to create a district. We're trying to do something meaningful in this area. And we think this project is a key component to that. It's kind of, it's a new type of apartment building. It, it combines the co-working type of environment with, uh, with co-living, with micro units and studios. This front building, this is, has the coffee shop in the lower portion here in our lobby. This contains uh, a few levels of office, a level of gym and some clubhouse function. Now, to, just to cut to the chase, since our last meeting, our primary concern is this area back here uh, on the bottom left of the screen along 490 West, which is where all the buses come and the tracks are immediately adjacent uh, to the West there. When we spoke last, just to give you some context where we started on this facade, th this is what it used to look like, right? A, a little barren and, and stark. Right, and, and so I, I, there were some comments about uh, trying to make this, give, give it more depth, give it more interest. This is where we've landed. We, we've created these little pocket parks. We, we've pushed these in further, to give it more depth to accentuate the building lines coming down. So it feels like more of a break than it did before. And giving a little more uh, attention to the detailing of the landscaping and how the vines interact with, with these columns which we planted a tree. We don't have a lot of room for trees, so we're really incorporating that into the architecture as well. Just a, another view of the same, so you get an idea of what the depth is along that walk along 490 West. So e each of these has similar characteristics, the plant, the tree planters, the benches, a planter and the, and the vine wall. This goes into the garage beyond, and th that's kind of the piece that we're discussing. As I back up, you can see these pocket parks, the land between the buildings. And below the building, at the base of the building itself, we're creating the art niches, right? And we're actually pretty excited about that, I am at least. The opportunity that we have to have something that's more interactive with the public. We, we like events, and so we're excited about the type of events we could have there. Just, just backing up, and for anybody that's new to this project, this is the, the elevation along 490 West, which backs up to the uh, front runner tracks and the, the bus stops along here. So on the far right of the screen is our amenity building, and that's an all concrete structure. We're breaking the inside and out of that and, and putting a lot of detail into that. That, that piece is, is right at the intersection that, that leads to the front runner, uh, to access the front runner platform. And so we, that's where the coffee shop lands, that's where our lobby lands, a lot of action and we're putting um, some seating areas for the coffee shop out on the street, with little planters to give them to define their space a little bit. And then moving to the north, this is where all the residence units happen. This, this is all studio and micro units. Being TSA Urban Core, we, we thought this is really an ideal spot to push the density a little bit. And we, we have 150 micro units and 150 studio units, and, and they're actually really cool units. Pretty excited about that, but we won't get into that. And the primary concern with the planning department was this lower facade down here, which is uh, a podium of parking. Given the constraints of the site, we have one level of parking above, and, and then we've gone down with another level into the water table down there. But we've put a, a lot of effort into this facade, working with the planning department and, and uh, from our working session last time. Uh, this is you know, a little view of the seating areas in front of the uh, coffee shop. 
just trying to activate that corner, giving it the mixed use component. Uh, just to view what the inside of that south building will look like. This would be filled with office space, with gym, and then you know, it has a roof deck on top, hot tub, fire pits, the whole bit. We like to have a little fun. Um, a close up of the art niches, what, what those look like. So they'll be about three feet deep. So we can actually walk in there, hang art, and they'll be lit at night and trying to create little moments of pause along that walkway. Uh, we, we love to have events in our projects. That's kind of what makes one, our projects unique in a way is, is the community that we create. And, and so we're excited about the potential of using this street. It's a really wide street, actually. So we're, we're excited about the opportunity of getting it on the gallery stroll. And we actually have murals in our nearby buildings and lots of display uh, areas in those as well. And so we think this could be a pretty hot area just to take over the street on occasion. So. That's in the plan. We're working with A Gallery and, and West High School for the artwork. For the very extreme north end, that's our dog park, or our, our, excuse me, our dog wash, which will be probably the nicest dog wash you've ever seen. And that's Caddy Corner. Just behind us in, in this rendering is, is our dog park. And, and just another view of those um, little parklets, the, the seating areas. So that's the project in a nutshell. I, I can go deeper into more detail, but I didn't want to rehash it too much, given that you know some of the familiarity that you have with it. But th this really is a new product type that we're bringing on, and we're really focusing on the social rather than a car or oriented. We're only parking about uh, fifty percent or point point five per unit stalls, point five stalls per unit. Um, we we have public parking in there as well for the coffee shop and uh, for the office space as well. And that's that's it in a nutshell. I'm interested to hear your comments and see if we've addressed your concerns from last time as well. Okay, thank you. Does anyone have any uh, questions for the staff or for the applicant at this point? Okay, I do. Okay, what is who's uh, I do? I couldn't tell. Is that Crystal? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. The material around the art pockets. I couldn't tell from the Dropbox what is that. Sure. Well, let me go to a view of that. So th th that is actually it's a four inch high uh, split face CMU block. There's two colors, two dark colors that we're using, and then precast that frames these pieces. Precast that caps it, precast that frames all the entries, and then some iron elements in there as well. The, is that like a stone? It's a split, it's a split face CMU block. So you know that there's bad CMU block and there's good CMU block, but it, it's basically like a large brick, if you will. Something that has more of a modular character like that, but it, it has a little bit of a stone look because of the way it's split like that. Where I'm getting stuck is how different the co-working space is from the rest. Mm -hmm. And it, maybe that material right there would be a place to connect up. Sure, that, that was intentional. That was very intentional, actually, to break that apart from the residences. And, and if, if you look at some of our buildings, you know, just to the south that face this, we've worked hard to bring a historical context to this neighborhood and to give it some variety as well. And so th this building where, where it's a different function, it's a different um, product type, we wanted it to feel different than the rest of the project. And so if you're back, you know, to the north is where people live and this is where people are, are working. This is where people are going to the gym, it has very tall floor to floor um, spaces. And, and it's meant to look like an older building where, where the rest is meant to look very new. I like that aspect of it. It's just for me, it's very busy, the contrast. I am the new guy. <laughs> well, I think it's it, it might be okay to be a contrast because there are different uses and 
And also, we don't, it is already in a really long facade. I mean, that's been a problem we've had from the beginning. And so having something different is more, um, it's more like having a city where things are built not all at the same time and not all the same way, I think. Yeah, exactly. That's the frame of mind we had, Brenda. So does anybody else have comments or any, Crystal, you have any others? Because you're the one who actually hasn't seen this. We, we saw it in a work session and, but the public has also not, uh, well, the public was invited to that, but, uh, in general, the public hasn't seen this one, so. I personally would just love to see a little more of the brick. I more what, say again? The brick? Oh, yeah. So how much of this project is brick, Ethan? Yeah, currently this front building, the cro what we call the crossing building, that, that is the brick building. And let me just jump back to an elevation if I can here. Here we go. And, and so the, the other portions that are meant to look more modern, they're very intentionally modern. That's where we're bringing in the wood and the glass. You can see we're putting a lot of glass in this compared to what you normally see on an, an apartment building, right? Keep in mind, this is an apartment building at the end of the day you know, contra contrast it to some of the others we've seen, but trying to bring the, the butterfly roofs in and the glass and the wood, trying to give this a really unique character where the front building is meant to look like an older building, like it's always been there. So we, we really feel these should contrast rather than trying to blend them together. Anyone else have questions for staff or for the applicant? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and open up the public uh, meeting. Uh, is there anyone from the neighborhood council who would like to speak? If so, you can raise your hand. I can, I'm not able to see that, but somebody is. Uh, I'm, I'm checking. I don't see any hands going up, but um let's give people a, a moment to try to find that button um we have not received any emails on this item as of yet okay and there doesn't appear to be any q a entered for people indicating that they want to speak is there anyone else who would like to speak oh, who's not on the we, community council we just had a hand go up um okay. So I'm going to unmute okay. Brian Hobbs. Okay, Brian, you're up. Brian, Mr. Hobbs, can you hear me? Hang on, he's in here twice, I think. Brian, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we, we can. can. Yes. I had to log off and come back on. That was probably it. So, so I'm with SALT Development as well. Um, Ethan and I attended the community council uh, a few weeks ago. And if nobody was here from the community council, I just wanted to give a little flavor or color from how that meeting went. Ethan and I walked through uh, many of the same renderings, even though we've uh, reworked some of the additional details following um, conversations with Nanette and her team. But uh, the community council traditionally uh, for West Capitol and the Marmalade area has been a very um, uh, fairly rigid community council where they care quite a bit about what's going on in their neighborhood. And after our presentation, I was surprised, and we've been to many community council meetings in, in, on past projects, I was surprised at the number of individuals that came up and thanked us for trying to put something historical, something elegant, um, some good architecture into their neighborhood. Um, we actually didn't hear a single negative comment in that community council, which frankly surprised us. So a little bit of commentary there. Ethan, maybe you can chime in and, and give some additional details, but, but we did spend a lot of time with the community council a few weeks ago. 
before Ethan goes in, let's see if there's any other public comments, please. I am not seeing any any other hands go up. Okay, seeing no uh, additional comments, I'm going to close the public meeting and open it up to discussion with the commission. So I'll pipe in. Uh, I, based on the working session, again, I just want to make the comment that I I am finding this architecture to be really attractive, and I'm generally never pleased by the architecture that I see in our project. So I want to commend you for for listening to staff Nanette and then our working session that you're really you're really hitting on the intent of what the zoning code says. And and I think that this is a very attractive development and it's gonna be a nice addition to that district. Add, Thank you. Add, add to Amy's comments that I've always been a huge uh, detractor of uh, long buildings, but you guys are without a doubt an exception to a rule, the rule, mm -hmm. and so I really appreciate the work you've done into it. I like it. Anyone else want to comment? I I also uh, really like the the way that the. Uh, green wall has been handled. I think that really makes a big difference, at least on the ground level, on the street level, in the perception of these buildings as being separate buildings, even though they're not. So I can entertain a motion if there's no further discussion. I'll make the motion. Who's that, Sarah? Maureen. Oh, Maureen. Sorry, go ahead, Maureen. <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> By the way, I like this building a lot. Uh, so based on the information in the staff report, I move the Planning Commission approve petition PLNPCM 2019-1106 regarding the Salt Lake Crossing Design Review in order to comply and have it comply with the standards of approval one, the design of the project will be consistent with the staff report and submitted design review application. Two, the TSA development score approval is required prior to the building permit approval. Three, the ground floors shall be built in such a way as to allow for future active commercial uses along street facing facades. And four, any changes to the site shall comply with all standards required by city departments. Thank I'll you. Second. I'll second, Amy. Thank you, Amy. I have a motion by Maureen, seconded by Amy. Um, all in favor, uh, so I'm gonna go through the roll call. I have my own list, so it's different. Amy? Yes. Maureen? Yes. Matt? Yes. Sarah? Yes. Crystal? Yes. The motion passes. <laughs> Did I call everybody name who's eligible to vote here? I think I did. Okay. And now we will go back to um, Brenda. I just have a question because we had two recuse. Yes. Do you have to vote. Uh, I well, based on the quorum rules. No, no. The chair would only vote. So we would need at least four yes votes for the pass. Okay. I thought with, with I thought with six of us that became the quorum, but even then the chair doesn't need to to cast a vote. Uh, it would only the chair would only cast a vote in instances where that vote is necessary to create a majority or in a tie. Correct. Okay, so it doesn't have any bearing on the quorum issue. No. Okay, good job. Thank you. And back to you, Adrian. Thank you, Brenda. Okay, we're now on to item number four on the agenda, the zoning map amendment at approximately 706 to 740 West, 900 South, case number PLN PCM 2019-01137. And Amy will be presenting this uh, application. 
Okay, good evening. Let me get my presentation up. Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay. So this is a request by the property owner for a map amendment to rezone 10 parcels and a portion of a city owned public alley at approximately 706 to 740 West 900 South. The properties are currently zoned uh, light manufacturing M1 and the request is to rezone them to RMU, which is residential mixed use. Staff is recommending that the commission forward a positive recommendation to the city council with conditions. There are two existing commercial buildings on the site. The applicant plans to rehabilitate for restaurant and retail type uses that are currently allowed under the M1 zoning designation, as well as the proposed RMU zoning designation. The requested rezone uh, would accommodate future development of the vacant eastern portion of the site for multifamily residential. The developer has not proposed a specific development plan as part of the rezone and does not have any pending building permits or other development applications for the property, with the exception of the uh, small alley that's uh, proposed to be to be vacated um, that's included in this rezone. Uh, the subject properties are located west of Interstate 15 along 900 South, one of the gateways to the west side neighborhoods. Several community uses surround the subject site, including the Nine Line Trail, Nine Line Bike Park, and Community Gardens. The predominant street frontage of the vacant portion of the properties is along 900 South as well as 700 West. The surrounding properties on the block are zoned M1, however, with the exception of just a few properties. The primary use is predominantly single family residential. There's also a religious use, a uh, summum adjacent to the site on the northeast corner of the block. These slides show um, a photo of the site as well as surrounding development. And this is uh, some of the surrounding development, the single family residential that is um, adjacent to the property. The projects uh, situated along 900 South and 700 West Industrial Corridor, an area that the West Side Master Plan identifies as an important gateway into the larger West Side community. The proposed RMU zoning district provides for a vibrant mix of uses that are more consistent with the future development goals and vision for the area than what could be developed under the existing M1 zoning designation. The parcels included in the proposed rezone are currently underutilized, mostly vacant land that are identified in the master plan as an appropriate area for high density housing. Uh, master plan policies supporting the proposed map amendment are discussed in greater detail in attachment D of the staff report. The proposed RMU zoning district does have minimal design standards that would apply to any new development under the zoning designation. Those design standards are 40% ground floor glass for facades facing a street and 15 foot maximum length of any blank wall. Under the RMU design standard, something like structured parking could be located on the ground floor, which would not be consistent with the active pedestrian oriented design envisioned in the master plan for this important gateway. Master plan policies in the area suggest that new development would benefit from additional design standards, such as an active ground floor use, and durable material requirements on the ground floor and upper floors. Planning staff um, is recommending as a condition that the design standards applicable to the D2 zone are applied to any new project on the subject parcels that are developed under the proposed RMU zoning district. One way this could be accomplished is through a development agreement. Development agreements can only be approved by city council. Uh, this slide shows um, the the design standards that would be applicable just under the RMU that's proposed, as well as the D2 design standards that staff is recommending are imposed on the project. And the properties within the boundaries of the Poplar Grove Community Council, prior to submitting the rezone application, the applicants did attend a Poplar Grove Community Council meeting, which was hosted on the subject site in the vacant warehouse buildings. During the meeting, Applicants discuss their plans to rezone the property, their intent for future development of the site. Um, planning staff also attended that meeting and answered questions, uh, questions from the community related to um, height, design standards, and building materials that would be applicable under the requested RMU zoning district. 
Um, we also sent a early notification to the community council chairs of Poplar Grove and Glendale community councils, as well as property owners and residents within 300 feet of the project. We also held an open house because the project's within two feet or 600 feet of two community council districts. And we did receive uh, two letters of support from both Poplar Grove Community Council and Glendale Community Council. And all, all public comments that were received as of the publication of the staff, re staff report are included in attachment G. And again, staff has reviewed the project uh, for compliance with the zoning map amendment standards. And we are recommending that the commission forward a positive recommendation to the city council with the conditions. And those conditions relate to um, the city owned alley and the petitioner entering into a purchase agreement with the city if the alley is approved by city council, as well as the um, design standards applicable to the D2 zone be applied to this project with the D2 zone. And that is all I have for the presentation. I believe the applicants have a presentation as well. Great, thank you, Amy. Any questions for Amy at this time? Uh, Amy Berry, let's go Amy Berry, then Brenda. Okay, thanks, Amy. I have a couple of questions. The first one is related to that valley, um, alley vacation. Um, oh. I'm generally opposed to them without more specific plans. Um, but we also have um, standards on the books of when somebody applies for an alley vacation or petitions for it. Um, has do you apply those like public nuisance, safety, um, whatnot? Were those looked at when you made your recommendation to approve the alley vacation on this one? So the alley vacation, um, the planning commission already reviewed that. Um, it it's been recommended by the planning commission and it's just this sorry i'm going back to the slide it's that tiny little orange area that's in between those two parcels okay so was this recommendation prior to me or was this the one where they had a proposal and they were going to make it part of like a you know a, a, a public area yes so it's the one with the proposal that we saw yeah, it's like a patio like a patio. patio. So they do have a so they had a proposal for what they wanted to do then, but now they're not putting that in part of this. They have a conceptual plan, but a conceptual plan isn't associated with this rezone. So they do intend to redevelop those two commercial buildings on the site um, into restaurant retail type uses, and they do intend to have the alley as part of that. Um, they they have not submitted a formal application. They do have a conceptual plan um, that they may show images of tonight, but there's not a development plan associated with this. Proposal. Now I re I remember the conceptual plan, but I didn't necessarily remember that it was this address. So okay, that's helpful. The other question I had was, what is the difference, and why are you proposing an RMU versus an RMU 35? which is what's happening to the West. What's the uh, difference? What's the main difference and why is an RMU more preferable than what, what's going on West? So uh, the applicants may be better able to answer that question as terms of why they're proposing what they're proposing. Um, but in terms of some of the main differences between RMU and RMU 35 would be the height. Um, RMU can go up to 75 feet for mm -hmm. residential uses and RMU 35 can go to 35 feet. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that's the biggest difference. There may be setback or other um, differences, but I think the height is the main difference. Okay. Thank you. The existing M1 zone, they're allowed to go to 65 feet. Okay. Brenda, did you still have a question? I forgot what it was, so sorry. We'll, I'm sure I'll remember it later. <laughs> okay. And, uh, Matt, do you have a question? Yeah. Um, okay. Is it, this modifying the design review standards as part of a zoning proposal. 
Um, I mean, I guess, so those would only apply to just this, just this area, this, this, these lots, um, you know, these properties. I just don't, it is a common, like, I don't know if I ever remember modifying design review standards for a specific parcel uh, with a zoning change ever before. I'm just curious on why that's happening together instead of going, you know, later as, a, as part of a plan development or something else that we're looking at those design review points instead of in a zoning project. The recommendation is to not to modify those specific standards. It's to impose additional standards because the RMU zone just has basically two design standards and the D2 zone has um, a lot more design standards and we're recommending that those are imposed on the project. Um, if at a time when the developer does have a development proposal, if they wanted to modify design standards, um, then they would come before you or it may be an administration. And those design standards then are only applicable to these parcels, not, is that correct? It would be tied to the rezone, yes, through a development agreement with but, the council. Yeah, there would have to be a development agreement entered into between the property owner and the city council. Right. So this is that plant that we, making that recommendation. That we do a rezone and then tie it to just with, with design standards, is that common? So this is Nick, I'm gonna weigh in on this one. Um, it's, not, it's not common, uh, this is actually fairly unusual. The reason why we are proposing this is because we feel like the RMU zone on its face is incompatible with what the master plan for the area says. And so we just haven't had time to update the RMU zoning district. We haven't had the staff resources to do it. And so this is our avenue to be able to do that at, the, at this time. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So if it's incompatible, then why are we proposing, why are we proposing approving it? Uh, because with these, with, with the proposed condition, it is compatible. So okay. So part of what it's compatible to put a 75 foot building there. So with, with the master plan and the city goals, yes, it is. One of the one of the issues that we're facing as a city is that we don't have a lot of areas where you can build residential, particularly multifamily. Uh, in fact, I think it's like 3% of our total land area is zoned for multifamily. And that includes all the mixed use districts like the D1 and the TSA zones and Sugar House Business District. Um, and so part of our some of the other master plan policies that we do have as a city um, do talk about transitioning some of these older industrial areas into more of a mixed use type of um, area and so given where this is and some of the other structures and infrastructure that's that's around it and what the current zoning allows as far as building scale we do think that 75 feet is appropriate Is there anything Any other else? Question? Is there, is there okay, anything there else that's going to around it? Sorry. So, the, the, yeah, so there's um, the, the M1 zone alone allows buildings, I think, up to 60 or 65 feet. And yeah. then to the north of here, where the um, LDS Church Welfare Square is, there's significantly taller structures there for that, those functions. Um, but most of the existing structures are are less than that. It seems to me, I went out to this neighborhood and it seems to me like that it's a primarily a fairly low scale neighborhood, but you, there may be some, some, uh, um, M, some M1 uses, but they're more warehousey than, and maybe old commercial buildings than um, taller structures. And there's a lot of um, single family uh, uses in this area too. So I'm sort of wondering about this ability. I mean, I don't think that having these design standards, I, I'm wondering if these is, well, let's put it this way. I'm wondering if these design standards actually have really, um, can, can really help uh, very much with something that's a pretty large scale building. So maybe we just let that go for now and let the applicant.
Any other questions at this point for staff? Okay, I think we will now move on to the applicant's presentation. Is the applicant here and ready to go? So I've made the app, there's four uh, people on the applicant's team and I don't know which one of them wants to make the presentation. It should be so, Max. It should be Max. Max, I'm here. Uh, all right, I will move that. All right, you should be ready to go, Max. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, first off, Amy, for uh, you know shepherding this this process. It's quite complicated. Um, I also want to thank the community for their input and their involvement. Um, you know, the neighbors in the community were were very uh, were very active and in, in, in voicing uh, their opinions. Um, you know, just from you know, I'm the I'm Max Kareth, the managing partner for for High Boy Ventures. Just from our side, um, we're we're really excited about uh, about the potential of this project, just because we think it could be a catalytic. Um, it could be very catalytic for for the west side, and and really sort of start activating um, the what you know sort of like that gateway uh, beyond I-15 and the railroad tracks. Um, just the point of my presentation, I think Amy uh, covered a lot of things, and there may be some redundancy. Um, I, I just really wanted to highlight how I felt um, that this zone amendment is, is really consistent with both the West Side Master Plan and the Nine Line uh, Corridor Master Plan. Um, just to give you a quick recap, I think you guys are familiar with this, but um, you know the, the the lot of you know the property uh, in question, as you can see, is 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 you know in the in the red lines. Um, we acquired both you know these two sites uh, just over a year ago. Uh, and obviously we're requesting uh, zone amendment from, from M1, which is light manufacturing to, to RMU. Um, just to dive right into it. I mean, I think, you know, according to the West Side Master Plan, um, there's, real, there's a real lack of connectivity between the West Side and, and the rest of the city. And I, I think it talks about strengthening the connections, you know, uh, sort of across um, from the West Side to, to the to other parts of the city. Uh, in particular, as you, as you're all familiar with, there's pretty much three nodes: 800 South, 900 South, and, and 1300 South. And, and 900 South was sort of identified as the one that needed the most attention. Again, I think I think you know, using you know, doing this zone amendment and, and trying to to um, change this vacant land into something that that is actually a mixed use development, I think I think would really be consistent with, with some of the visions of, of the master plan. I think I think you saw this. I think I, I pulled this as well from the nine line master plan. I think this, this was in Amy's presentation. I, I think really the, the, the main point being, um, obviously, as you're well familiar with, there's a, there's a BMX bike park, there's community gardens. So clearly, you know, the city is is, is very aware of, of this being sort of a keynote. We think doing a mixed use development here, I think, would be would really add to so creating. Um, this idea of a major gateway and, and really um, doing away with currently it feels to me like very much if you come from if you come on 900 south from from the east towards there I, you know the, the the railroads the railroad tracks uh the i-15 seem very much like a barrier and, and i think there's it almost like sort of prevents you from going across and and i think i think you guys were obviously qu asking questions about height you know, there is there is two two reasons uh, for height that that we that we thought about um, is one just to start. Obviously, the you know we talked about structures that are high around there. The I fifteen freeway is actually forty five feet high, so it's actually pretty high up, and it's quite intimidating. I think putting a building, and that's one of the reasons that that we asked for MU, putting a building that's a little bit above would create you know as people drive yeah. by, we create sort of like you know, and sort of an attraction for people to go, oh, what's on that side? And I think that was the idea. And then second, um, there's obviously quite a noise issue. And, and we thought, um, you know, putting a building that's a little bit higher than, than the freeway would be would be advantageous in, in creating a noise barrier. Um, and, then, and then finally, I think you talked about, um, you know, the height being sort of 
maybe too high relative to what's what's next to it. Again, we're not talking about getting rid of those existing uh, vacant warehouse buildings, which, which I don't know how high they are, but assume they're about 25 to 30 feet high. I think it would sort of be a step down to sort of, you know, the more lower um, single family housing. Um, again, this is sort of a, I wanted to zoom out to sort of give you sort of a little bit of an idea of where exactly this is located. I, I think this development makes a lot of sense. If you think of all the things that are happening on that 900 South, sort of extending, extending that development, I think creating, like I said, a gateway, sort of a catalytic project on the other side of the freeway, I think would be, would be really great for, you know, kind of, you know, getting people to go across that barrier that is currently I-15 on the railroad tracks, you know, make use of the Jordan River Park and all the amenities that the West Side have, has. Um, again, you know, we talked about, you know, um, the West Side Master Plan. You know, I think, I think one, of, one of the things that it talks about is how um, there is an inequitable share of land dedicated to manufacturing uses. Again, I think with this zone amendment, I think we would, we would obviously um, help, help with that. And again, I think it's in the spirit of, of the West Side Master Plan. I think one of the things um, that we talked about um, here when, when we sort of talked to the community, um, there was a lot of talk about what the community was looking for. And obviously a lot of things that we, we, heard, we heard was services, uh, restaurants, coffee shops. There's not actually a coffee shop you know, uh, uh, west of, of I-15. Um, so, so I think that's one of the reasons I think um, we're, we're trying to come up with this mixed use is, is to really um, create services, you know, in those vacant warehouse buildings, which is phase one with sort of like a public, um, you know, a public square for the community and eventually for potentially, you know, residents of the future uh, mixed use uh, development. Uh, but I think, I think the idea really is, is, is to, create um, services for the community um, as such as restaurants and coffee shops in those warehouse spaces, which I'll address, you know, at, at the end of the presentation, I'll talk a little bit about, about this phase one. And then finally, you know, we talk about, you know, multifamily um, infill, in again, both, both plans um, sort of, you know, uh, talk about that as being an issue. I think, again, the zone amendment would sort of address um, uh, th this issue. Um, in the sense of, I think it's 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 prime it's prime land to be sort of, you know, of, of, which we should dedicate to sort of more residential, um, uh, more residential use. Um, just to give you an idea, this is some more pictures of of what this looks like now. Um, obviously, we have these two vacant commercial structures. Uh, we've got the alley. Uh, we want to re-energize this area by, like I said, creating some some services for the local community. Obviously, that's a little bit tied into, you know, being able to uh, get the zone amendment done so we can actually have more residents and, you know, you know, more residents on what is currently the vacant land to sort of, you know, get more um, activity going in this area. Uh, we also want to reinvigorate the neglected mid-block crossing. Uh, like I said, we talked a little bit about um, that sort of public, um, that public square between the two, those two buildings. And as you can see I'll, on the next presentation, that that's the hope what it look what it will look like when we actually are done with um, you can see that arch that's essentially between those two buildings that's a view from the alley looking east um, so um, that's essentially what we're, what we're trying to do um, just an update on that I think uh, we finalized the budget on this we're working with the RDA obviously we're, we're trying to get financing with the RDA we, we we're pretty far along as, as you may know, uh, but we're finalizing uh, the budget at the end of this month. It's coming in as, as we expected, and, and we're, we're looking to apply for billing permits on this phase one, uh, hopefully in May. And again, I think the whole, uh, the, I, like I said, we're, we're pretty excited about this project. We, we think it'd be really great to extend the vibrancy of, of, of what's happening in the granary west of I-15 and, and, and sort of create a nexus of activity. Uh, you know, like like I said, mixed use development with with services, commercial activity, and and, and more residential. I think um, that's all I have. Great, thank you very much. Do we have questions for the applicant? Matt has one. Your renderings don't show a like sixty five foot building. I'm just. Uh... Talk me through like what, how you see that kind of fitting on the piece, the parcel, if it's, 
if you're just going that through part of the parcel, if the whole parcel is going to be 65 feet, I mean, give me a sense of how you see all I mean, of that playing itself out. To be honest, this is a two-phase project. I, I, from my perspective, I think this, it's really sort of a little bit contingent on the zone amendment. I, I, think, I think this idea of 65 feet, I, I, like I told you, I think, I think my biggest concern is I, I think to create, to be successful, to be successful with the commercial phase one, I think, I think you know, obviously currently it's mostly, you know, single family homes there. I think to, to really be successful with the commercial services, I think you need to do a little bit more density on, 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 the, vacant, on, on the vacant land. Uh, I'm not sure I'm, 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 I'm asking for 65 feet. What I'm asking for is, I think it would be great to be above the freeway because the freeway, if you, if you walk there, it's, it's quite imposing. And actually having, having a structure that actually is a, um, a little bit taller than the freeway would actually, I think, enhance the neighborhood because now you're actually looking at a nicer building. And B, I think it would be, uh, you could see it from the freeway and it would attract people to finally come to that side and sort of create an extension of the granary. So I, I'm not here sitting, I mean, I'm not telling you that I want a 65 foot building. I, and we really haven't talked that much about design. I mean, GSBS is helping me with this and, and we've mastered, I think the way we've had it is, is roughly, you know, like I said, um, probably a story higher than, um, than the, um, than the uh, freeway. I mean, I'm, so, I'm not opposed to the, increased height it's more opposed to like a giant or cube being placed um in the spot so i'm sure i guess that's that i think the only thing i can tell you is obviously you know from my perspective you know these two buildings actually it's very expensive to to do an adaptive reuse on these buildings these two these two you know uh warehouse buildings which i think are beautiful and i want to keep because i think they're they're part of the history of of this, I think we would not try to put a building there um, that would clash with that, or just I think we're obviously pretty mindful of aesthetics. Um, and I think obviously, you know, if we have to come back uh, for design review, I think we would obviously we know that you know Amy and, and planning would certainly want to see certain standards, and as well as the community. I think that's you're sort of addressing the biggest issue the community has had, which is nobody wants like an ugly building there. There, there aren't any. I don't know any Thing protecting those warehouses other than you know currently um they're not historic or anything there's no protections on them that prevents them they're not. they're not yeah correct thanks so on page 14 and i think 15 of the staff report we see a massing uh drawing it's basically uh showing a you know sort of how big a building could be built there? Actually, it built you know it could be bigger than that, really. Um, not, uh, but certainly how tall it is. So, is that sort of? Uh, I know that you haven't designed anything, and it was. It's obviously not going to be a big white box like shown here, uh, but that re accurately represents like a seventy-five foot tall building mass and mass so you might be you might you would be able to build with an rmu zone yes i, th I think i think to address your question I, I think i think it's pretty i think it's it i think it's important that you're i think the massing that you see is a, is six story is maybe a six-story building um, um just like, because i think it looks like more like eight seven or eight but yeah okay I, I think we're trying to get above uh, the freeway. That, that's sort of like the, the whole purpose of, of that. And so that's really where I'm coming from is, is I think being above the freeway, I think, A, th th this, we need more housing in the city. I mean, we all know this. I think this is a great place. This is a transitional area. If there's gonna be a place next, you know, where we're gonna put a higher building, I think it should be next to a freeway. So we're just literally just trying to be realistic and saying, you're absolutely right, we could go that high. But I think, it would be actually beneficial to the neighborhood to be actually taller than the freeway. Yeah, and if I can jump in, I, I would actually agree with the applicant. I think a taller building next to a freeway is actually a benefit. Um, as long as we start to terrace and break down the, the mass as we get towards the residential side of the building or towards the plaza side, um, obviously this is a placeholder and I think it's a little misleading as to what the potential of the building is. Um, but I've, I've worked on sites similar to this, and I feel that 
just to block some of the sound and block the visual impact of what the freeway is and how imposing it is on the neighborhood. I think something like this actually makes sense. And as the neighborhood develops around this, I would hope to see kind of things that would transition that scale as, as the rest of the neighborhood develops as well. Um, but that being said, I, I do think it would be good to do a working session like, like we've done in the past on some of these projects we've talked about tonight, um, just so that we can kind of verify that those things start to happen and it's not just the big box. Uh, Madam Chair, can I, can I add to that? This is Amy. Yes. Um, I was just going to add uh, what Commissioner uh, Lee just said. Um, that was the set, the um, that was similar to what the comments were when we attended the community council meeting. Um, many of the residents commented on how um, they thought that this a taller building would um, shield sound from the freeway, and um, they thought it would be a good uh, transition to not have to see the freeway and rather see a build see a building. So I just wanted right. to add to that. Thanks, Amy. Um, yeah, I would agree. And given that the adjacent parcel under the ME zone could also be much taller if they were built to their full density, um, it doesn't seem to me that it's that radical a change, um, even based on what's currently uh, in existence in the area. Um, okay, any other questions for the applicant right now? Okay, then why don't we go to the public hearing? I'll, I will open the public hearing. Um, is there anyone here from the community council who would like to speak? Uh, Madam Chair, and yes, I'll we do have. rely on Nick. Yeah, we do have Dennis Ferris from the Community Council. He's unmuted, and uh, I'll let him speak. Thank you very much, Nick. Okay, thank you. Hello, all. Um, my name is Dennis Ferris. I am former chair, current vice chair of the Poplar Grove Community Council. Um, would definitely love to speak on behalf of this project. Um, I'm strongly in favor of it. This developer and his team have been in constant communication with us and the council in the community um, since day one. He first called us to say that he had the property under contract and before he determined a plan for the site, he wanted to hear what it is the community wanted or needed to have. Um, that communication has continued since day one. Um, so we've been engaged. He has actually implemented any and all possible suggestions and requests that we have made. Um, I think it's a grand tribute to them and their plan that phase one is to renovate and restore the existing historic buildings, even though there is no pre-existing protection for them, um, that he felt that that was an important step one to do. I think says a lot for his willingness to work with and for the community as a whole. Um, along with this rezone, some neighbors nearby the property on the same block have also inquired about rezoning their own properties, um, looking perhaps to rebuild their homes, that sort of thing. And it's a tad more difficult to do in an M1 zone than it would be with an RMU. Um, and these guys have actually assisted us along the way in helping those residents to further that application process too. Um, so hopefully you'll be seeing that rezone request soon. Um, this project would give us a much needed increased housing density within the city, um, within our neighborhood. As you guys saw, there is a lot of single family homes. In fact, in our neighborhood in particular, there is a more land per house than just about anywhere else. Um, and to be able to offset that and get a few more people in there would actually be good. Um, it's a little bit stronger tax base, tax base there. Um, let's see. Developer also has immediately cleaned up the property upon closing of the deal. Um, it was a horrific eyesore for many, many decades um, and has already been cleaned up dramatically and he has kept it secure. Um, he's proven to be a strong partner for us already. Um, the access here to 
connect the east and west sides um, across that grand physical barrier of the freeway and the railway would be a much needed step. Um, the access to the nine line trail that is soon to be continued eastward all the way up to the east bench. Um, access to regional parks like Jordan Park, um, the bike park that's kitty corner from this project, the community gardens right across the street gives it a lot of available green space for even the majority, the large number of families that could potentially reside in this project eventually. Um, and as far as I know, some people are concerned about the overall possible height of this, um, but within one block, when you've got not just the grain silos at Welfare Square, you also have the silos of the Mountain Cement Company. You also have the silos that is the Fear Factory um, Haunted House. There are plenty of taller buildings immediately surrounding it and that are are less desirable to see. Um, so yeah, this could be a huge improvement to the neighborhood as a whole. We would love to see it. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Nick, is there we any? Also, there is another um, person who wants to speak, Mike Reed. Yes, can you hear me? Great. Yeah. Um, yes. What I'm concerned about is um, I own property in the area, but is it is that we're getting rid of all the areas for low income housing. There's nothing included for affordable housing. Yes, we're buying up this land and the neighbors want to be able to change their zoning so they can put a big building in. But, you know, what, what this is doing is just shaking up all the land that low income people used to live in. And, and yeah, we've got some big buildings, but we don't allow for any type of um, affordable housing. There are schools just up the street on, on uh, 7th West, Jackson Elementary. There's Bryant, which they bus people over to. There's West High. But, but we don't have anything that really caters to multifamilies, which is what they said they were wanting to do. And, and I tried to make a comment during the last thing about where do people park their friends? And, you know, and, and, and where is the low-income housing involved in this that allows people to, to stay in the neighborhood? Um, we're building these huge buildings but we're not allowing for the we're gentrifying everybody out of the neighborhoods and um pretty soon we'll, we'll, we probably will close uh, jackson elementary because all the homes will surely disappear because we're we're building these 65 foot story buildings and, and that's my concern is that yeah we've got these things and people want to sell their house up but they're lower income homes and that's where people who are on section eight or or from their own home actually live. Anyway, that's my concern. I I, I, um, I actually am um, involved with another project with affordable housing and, and I don't know if I missed it, but I at the end, maybe we could uh, revisit it. You probably might've already voted on it. And because I, I guess I thought it started closer to 7.30 or eight. But anyway, that's my comment is, is that there's, we've eliminated low income housing and we're taking up all the land on the west side and and where are these other people going to live anyway that's my comment is that right. we're using thank that you. hate to rehash it thanks thank you nick are there any other uh people who would like to speak uh we did receive uh, now two emails that i think michaela okta is going to read into the record Um, they're from the same person from the Sum Mum Church. It's from Bernie Al. The first email says it appears Salt Lake City is allowing more and more high density apartment buildings to be constructed. And with the proposed zoning change, we're concerned that the same will happen in this area, which has been a relatively peaceful area and has been home for our minority church temple sanctuary. Should this happen, it will be it will completely change the pleasant dynamics currently going on in the area. We also understand the developer is interested in obtaining more property close by. We understand there currently are no specific development proposal. Is there going to be any oversight on what the site plan is? 
We oppose any zoning change until we understand what is specifically intended for this area. Um, and then Bernie wrote another comment in after the community council's comments. So now we are finding out our church, which has been a sacred place of respite and sanctuary for individuals coming to partake of the divine Milu, is now going to be hemmed in by a very tall building right next to us. This is very concerning. It will impose significantly on the religious environment that we've established since 1978. This is not a benefit to us at all and imposes on our minority church. We'll stop. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michaela. Nick, are there any other comments or um, people who want to speak live? It does not appear that we've received any other um, comments and no other hands are up. Okay. Given that no one else wishes to speak, I will now close the public meeting um, and bring this back to the commission. And I guess I have a question for staff before we go back into this. Um, do we know the location of, of the existing church? Is that adjacent to this site or do we have any idea of where that from the comment we just received? Yeah, so um, I don't have the I don't have my screen sharing abilities anymore, but if you look on the staff report in the um, site plan, it's basically the north, um, the northeast portion of that block. So it's, um, I don't know if you are familiar with the site having driven out there or anything, but it's where the there's a pyramid on the corner. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just got presented. So, so where the, so so where the property you. boundary jogs in, the, and the parcel, the portion of this block that's not included within this petition, that's where the um, the existing church is, where we received the comments from the pastor. Right, so um, it I, I got my screen sharing abilities back, so it's just that corner that's not included in the orange outlined area on the same block. And is that entire, is that one lot or two? Is that entire so, lot used as the church? Um, I believe just the corner property is. I'm. I don't think that they own the property to the west, but I'm not um, positive about that. But yes, the corner property is um, the same. Okay. Property. And I did okay. speak to um, somebody from that uh, group. Came to the open house as well as came to the city offices to talk about um, just what would be required in terms of setback. What setbacks what they could do now versus what they could do under the RMU um, and they were mm -hmm. going to submit some comments to me but I never received those so there is um, a notation of that in the staff report I believe it's on page um, 43 just analyzing um, what the differences are between what they could build now versus what they could build under the RMU um, which does have greater setback restrictions the RMU zone does in terms of the um, rear yard setback, and I believe the interior side yard, or that may be the same. Okay. I see that now. Yep. Um, I, I'll go back uh, to the applicant to see if he had any, wanted to respond to any of the comments that we received. Um, thank, thank you for giving me. I, I guess the only thing I would question is the peaceful nature of, of the neighborhood. The alley um, is, is pretty well known as being, um, having a lot of crime, which is one of the reasons that we're trying to activate it. Um, and I think we, there's a lot of issues there. We've had a lot of issues um, with people leaving junk, garbage, which is why I think in the pictures you can see why we put the concrete barriers in. We've had a lot of um, issues towing, um, you know, RVs. It's, it's, it's been a lot of things. So 
you know, I'm sure it's peaceful. I, I just, from my perspective, I think, you know, getting a few more people there, is, I think it would benefit the neighborhood in terms of, you know, creating a little bit more um, just people on the streets and eyes, eyes on the streets. All right, thank you. Okay, bring it back to the commission to see if anyone has any questions for staff, um, any discussion, or if anyone's willing to entertain a motion. I would like to make a, a comment um, in relation to um, affordable housing. I think one of the misconceptions is that creating more housing automatically makes everything else more expensive. And the comment I want to make is, you know, this lot in particular, we're not really tearing down any existing homes. It's really cleaning up two lots that are um, pretty rough at the moment, if I'm being honest. Um, and, and in theory, the, you know, these are going to create more housing for people in a housing shortage. So that should maintain the existing homes to be more affordable. And I just want to talk to that because I feel like it comes up a lot and I think it's misunderstood a little bit um, that just creating housing doesn't automatically make everything more expensive. Um, I think it can help keep the things around it more affordable. And the other comment I wanted to make was um, a lot of the homes nearby aren't talking about necessarily selling their property. They're just trying to get more, uh, an easier access to just upgrade their homes to make them nicer, which I also think is a, is a benefit to the community as well. Um, and maintaining their homes to be able to keep those at, as affordable housing. So that's kind of my comments. Yeah, thanks for that, John. Yeah, and I just wanted I to like also um, make the comment when we talk about where density kind of belongs, if we think back in the presentation we had from the Wasatch Front Regional Council, um, you know, some of the things that they've brought up have really broaden my view about where density belongs. Because we do need more housing, but we don't want density everywhere. And we have, you know, low density, mid density, medium density, and high density. And, and when we look, when I look at now places where high density really makes sense, this is one of them. One, it's adjacent to the freeway, but it's also very close to freeway um, access on that West Temple. Um, off, on ramp and off ramp. And I think that um, those are areas that are more prime for where we should be focusing um, some of this density to try to meet our housing needs. And, and that's something I just want to throw out there as we, as we look at how the city continues to change. Thanks, Amy. And Brenda, do you have a comment? Yeah, I do. Um, so one of the things that hasn't been raised here and We've talked about, um, you know, having the height and additional density near highways, but I think that one of the things that we are not considering and should consider um, in terms of a zoning change to residential, there's a reason that these, that there are um, M1 zones along highways. Highways are noisy and they create quite a bit of air pollution. And there's actually been some studies uh, quite a few studies actually done about the level of air pollution, damaging air pollution, lead, uh, nitrous oxide, uh, and other kinds of particulate matter that accumulate along highways to the detriment of, particularly of children. So, uh, and so, so people are now no longer uh, uh, wanting to have schools near highway because of the uh, possibility of children being out and playing and so forth. So, I don't think as a general rule, putting a high density uh, residential neighborhood, re residential area right next to a highway. And I, I don't know, I was trying to find um, the literature on it just now, but um, uh, of the distance, but it's certainly within the distance that this project is uh, next to the highway. So I think this is a consideration that uh, we, we have not discussed. And um, by allowing a pretty dense residential uh, project to go in here, I think that, I mean, I had no problem with this project when, it, when I thought it was, for some reason, a lower um, height project when we were talking about the original uh, project that we were looking at where the alley was vacated. Uh, 
Um, but now that I hear it's intended to be this kind of significant major building, um, I really have some issues with changing the zoning so we allow something like this to be built where children will be allowed to live there. <laughs> So I just maybe want to join that discussion. Prior to me being on the planning commission, planning commission approved a residential building that's going to be built right along um, the freeway in Sugar House. Two major office buildings and a major residential building. That residential building is being built now. Um, and so I'm sure I could think of other high density buildings that are already in existence adjacent to freeways in addition to ones I that one I know is going up so uh why aren't we concerned about that everywhere and prior to me getting on was that brought up for the residential um building that's going to be built um, in the sugar house business district adjacent to the freeway Brenda, I think you're on mute. The answer is, I don't think it was brought up, but I think it should be an issue for res high density residential zoning everywhere. I mean, I was involved in building an apartment building right on a freeway, and I still look at that building and regret every day, you know, the amount of pollution that goes into right in through the window, you know, 30 feet away from, uh, from the highway. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. It's a, I was just going to make a comment that I agree that that's a valid concern. And I don't know if the project still pencils is like maybe a hotel where people aren't living there. Then maybe they're just a temporary resident um, or another use, but um, it is a valid concern. Sorry. <laughs> Any other uh, discussion from the commission? Or is anyone willing to make a motion? And again, we are simply recommending to the city council, they have the final approval over this application as it's a reason. I'll make a motion. Real quick, can I? Thanks. Sorry, I was, I was just going to make uh, a comment um, about the, con the recommended condition of applying the design standards for the D2 zone. Um, and I know this hasn't been brought up, but I do think that the commission has a couple of options with that. One of the options that you do have is just to re instead of trying to apply standards um, that haven't really been factored into this area necessarily or analyzed is you do have the option of requiring any new development to go on that parcel to go through the design review process. Um, and that process has fairly extensive standards that that they would have to demonstrate how they meet those standards instead of having the prescribed standards of the D2 zone applying. Um, just throwing that out there as something for the commission to consider. Thanks, Nick. Okay. Um, I'm ready to make a motion if that's okay. Yes, please. Um, based on the analysis and findings listed in the staff report information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed zoning map amendment from M1 to RMU file PLN PCM 2019-01137 for 10 parcels and a portion of a city owned alley located at approximately 706-740 West, 900 South with the conditions listed in the staff report. Also with a third condition that any new development must go through the design review process. Second. Okay. 
The motion by Sarah, a second by John. Um, let's start with Maureen. Yes. Amy. Yes. John. Yes. Matt. Yes. Brenda. No. Sarah. I'm voting yes, and I want to put on record that I'm really uh, I'm grateful to the builder or developer for being so uh, active with the community and really listening to their needs. And I just am glad when we have good neighbors. So thanks to him. And Crystal. Yes. Okay. Uh, four in favor, one opposed, motion passes. So the matter will next be heard by the city council for approval. And I'd like to reiterate what Sarah um, noted. It is nice to see and hear from community representatives and developers who have engaged productively and worked together to come before us. And we do appreciate that. So best of luck. All right, item Thanks. five. Thank you. Item five on our agenda, the zoning map and master plan amendment at approximately 261 North Redwood Road, case numbers PLN PCM 2019-01086 and PLN PCM 2019-01087. And um, Sarah is providing the staff report, is that right? Yes, thank you. Great. So you can you see my screen now? Yes. And can you hear me all right as well? Yes, thank you. Great. So uh, this is a proposal to rezone a split zoned property from R15000 single family residential and RMF 35, moderate density multifamily residential to RMF 35. The proposed rezone is anticipated to allow for redevelopment of the site with additional multifamily housing. To provide a greater context, the property is located on the west side of Redwood Road. It's approximately a quarter mile north of North Temple, and it's also north of several properties zoned TSA where there are apartments under construction or currently or I'm sorry, recently constructed in this general area here. This one is under construction now. As far as the existing zoning, as I mentioned, it's split zoned. You can see the RMF 35 portion here and the R15000 portion here. This is a result of a 1987 rezoning that affected approximately 750 acres. At that point in time, there was concern regarding more intensive development of properties in the area. And right now the property to the south is zoned RMF 35. Further to the south is TSA zoned property. To the east is additional TSA zoned property. And then to the north and west are properties that are also zoned R15000. As far as the existing conditions on the site, the left shows the photograph of the existing development from Redwood Road. And then the right photo shows the um, rear of the property looking towards um, Redwood Road from Gemini Drive, which terminates at the rear of the property. There are some existing zoning limitations with the split zoning. The property currently has four units. There's enough land area for one additional unit. The R15000 zoned area has enough land area for five units. This would likely be difficult because of the frontage requirements. The proposed zoning would allow for up to 26 units on the site. As far as compatibility with a master plan, the proposal requires a master plan amendment. However, it is consistent with some planning documents. Plan Salt Lake has growth and housing initiatives that it's consistent with. These include locating development near transit and transportation corridors. And it's located about a quarter mile north of the tracks line on North Temple. And Redwood Road also has a frequent uh, service. It also promotes infill and redevelopment and underutilized land. It would increase medium density housing options, and it would also direct growth to areas with existing infrastructure, which are all included in Plant Salt Lake. 
The proposal is also consistent with growing SLC and it's consistent with the North Temple Master Plan station area policies and strategies. Um, the Northwest Master Plan, which was adopted in 1992, does not call for changes in this area. Um, but as previously discussed, there has been a number of changes in the area recently, and the proposal is consistent with some of those with some of those changes. It would provide for a transition from more intensive development. It would provide additional housing in the area, and it would provide infill development on an underutilized parcel. As far as public process, planning mailed a recognized organization notice, sent early notification to property owners, and also sent the public hearing notice and staff has not received comments from the public. And so uh, staff's recommendation is that based on the information in the staff report, planning commission recommends that the planning commission or our staff recommends that the planning commission forward a positive recommendation to the city council for the proposed zoning map amendment and also the proposed master plan amendment. And that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Sarah. Are there any questions for Sarah at this point? Okay. Is the applicant here or somewhere? <laughs> the the <laughs> applicant here. the applicant is available. Uh, Ian Cameron, I have unmuted his microphone. Ian, are you with us? Here to have some uh, audio issues with Ian. Ian, can you um, type in a question into the Q and A to make sure that we can hear you, or does that you can hear us? We also see signs that the curve may be flattened. That is to be enforced, but we're still seeing. <laughs> I think yeah. we hear somebody's news in the background. I don't know who else is. Um, looks like everybody else is muted except Ian. And I don't know why he can't hear us or. Or respond. Um, maybe what we can do is open, if you want, we can open the, the public hearing. He was communicating through the Q&A earlier. Um, so he was present. And I don't know if he's having difficulties. Ian, if you're having dif difficulties, you may want to um, exit the meeting and, rejoin. and try yeah. to rejoin if you can hear me. And um, but let's try that. You can also call into the phone number. All right. Well, while, while we wait for it, Ian, why don't we move to the, the public hearing? Um, I'll go ahead and open the public hearing. Um, do we have anyone from the community council who, is, who would like to speak? Uh, I, don't, I don't know anyone. We do have one hand up. Um, Mike Reed. Mike, do you wanna comment on this item as well? Yeah, <clears throat> can you hear me now? I, I am. I'm concerned. Uh, again, it's about affordable housing, and you know, like the Fourth West project, the apartment complex there, they rent their apartments for twenty-five to five thousand dollars a month, and and yeah, people say, oh yeah, we're going to include those people, but who can afford twenty-five hundred to five thousand dollars a month? Five thousand dollars a month can buy you a million-dollar house, and and and. What we're doing is we're we're putting up all these buildings where nobody can afford to live. 
and we're because it's a cheap land and we're eating up all if we did this in the avenues people would be really upset if we allowed all this kind of development and anyway that's my that's my concern is that why don't we talk about how much we're going to rent these places for and and, and see if people can really afford them if they if they're not sub to subsidize somehow 2500 to 5000 dollars a month that's bizarre Anyway, that's my concern is, is that we're just eating up all the West Side, putting up all these buildings. Nobody can afford, none of the poor people can afford them. Uh, uh, even if they're, even if they're, even Section 8 won't even subsidize it because they have a window. But we have a certain window that, that people can, can rent. And if you can't fill that window and the people will drop, drop their rent, those people cannot live there. So we're just eating up all, gentrifying the whole West Side. Uh, that's my concern. And... You know, where are the parks going to be? There's no, there's no parks that, that are really around there. Do we have any area for people to, to, to go play soccer? Other than there's one over by the Jordan River where there's a school. When the school's there, they don't allow people in. They, they lock the gates. Anyway, I, that's my concern. So uh, that, that we're not, we're locking everybody out of, out of to live in that neighborhood, out of living there. The children can't live there. Anyway, I appreciate it. That's my comment. I, I'm just concerned about low-income housing and how it's disappearing. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Same to me. Nick, is there anyone else um, who's indicating they would like to speak? Uh, I do not see any other comments. Um, I'm going to try to get in touch with Ian again and see if I can. And have we received any emails either that need to be read? Um, I, let me double check. No, I do not see any at this point. Let me see if I can message Ian real quick. So since there's no one else who wishes to speak, I will close the public hearing and we will see if we can get a hold of the applicant. Well, we're waiting for the applicant. Can I ask Sarah a question? Sure. So, Sarah, maybe I missed this, but I see in the in some of the pictures this Gemini Drive that seems to be closed where this property is. How is that? Has that been closed, and or are they going to build on that, or do we know will they have to keep that open? Um, as they create a design. Sure, sorry. So Gemini Drive does end at that property boundary. And um, so they did, I'm not sure what their proposal would be at this point. I think it would depend on whether they would need access from Gemini Drive or not. They haven't submitted a proposal as part of this project, but right now the right of way for it ends at the property. It ends at the property on both sides. I've, have, I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. How, how, is there a history? How do we, how did that happen? Well, I don't believe it extends further to the south. I think that's um, kind of a, that's a private driveway on that property. Let me go ahead and put my screen back up and I can at least put on the aerial that shows that. From the look of it, it looks like the only way you could develop it would be to have a fire lane that ran that whole length. Um, Otherwise, it'd be too deep to build anything. It's it's a little difficult to see with the, the color of the zoning on top, but you can see that for um, 247 and 257, those are part of a single development, and there's um, a driveway that extends, and that's part of that development rather than a public street. Okay, on page 12 of the staff report, it's you don't see the colors, and it looks like it's a street coming from both directions, so they that just is coincidence, I guess. Well, that's a multifamily 
development to the south, right? It's an apartment complex. Right. Yeah, basically there. Are, that yeah. that's a that's actually just a, a service or or a fire lane within that. Uh, I was out there today, and it, it doesn't even really line up. So I mean, it kind of lines up. You could be, you could do it, but if even if you did do it, it would be difficult. You may you might you would have to get the permission of the apartment complex to use that right. as an access way, and that. Okay. That is n by no means, um, you know, uh, that's not our place. No, I just, I'm, I, as I'm looking at it on this page, I, I assume that Jim and I drive one all the way through and wondered. So yeah, that's a clarification. That's what I needed. Thank you. And I just wanted to add, um, and when the applicant didn't provide a site plan or any kind of development proposal, but did indicate, um, in at least part of his submittal that there was some intent to develop low income housing on the property. Um, I didn't include that as part of the presentation, but um, based on the comments, just wanted to add that. Thanks, Sarah. Nick, any luck getting a hold of the applicant? So I have another question for Sarah. How, how wide is this property? Is I it believe it's 76 feet wide. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm trying to contact him by every avenue, every avenue I have available to me. So give me just one second to send him an email. And I did okay. send him an email a few minutes ago as well. I'll let us see it. I've got to say this meeting has been pretty smooth up until this moment. So kudos to everybody. <laughs> they all stand up and stretch. Oh my gosh. It's a good plan. <sighs> so here are my thoughts if we can't get the applicant. Uh, the line but we can um, continue the matter or we can proceed without the applicant without their input that's maybe a difficult decision but uh, we can do it what is the next but meeting in general look like what does the next meeting agenda look like? How how long is this gonna be? Give me a second and I'll I'll take a quick look at it. Okay. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is this is this is a recommendation to the city council, so there is we're not the final decision making body here. So if we wanted to proceed and vote on this item, that he would still have an opportunity um, to make a presentation to the city council before the final decision is made. But again, I agree with Paul. It's I, I'd just like to point out that I was looking at the width of this lot and it's pretty much the same as the width of the lot for the CW Urban LE project that we just looked at. So um, knowing how those guys had sort of put that thing together, this would be a likely one way that a person could develop a lot that was long and skinny like that. I, I do have one question for uh, Sarah is, and I'm pretty sure this is correct, but we, we can connect with a private drive from Redwood Road over to that alleyway. Is that correct? It would be like a one-way road and then be able to do units off that private drive. 
<laughs> Sorry, um, I did get an email response back from the applicant, and he said that he was. Oh. I'm, I muted myself. I did get an email back from the applicant saying he was needed a password, and I sent him the link again. Um, could you give? Could you tell me your question one more time on the um, the access? Oh, yeah, back up. just with the narrow lot, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the answer already, but just Redwood Road to that alleyway for like a drive through access of a one way street, would that be viable to connect those two with a private drive? It seems that way to me, but and that would be a decision the applicant would need to make as part of their proposal. Yeah, so just when you look at fire lanes and other things, I think it, it seems feasible as a buildable site. That's my only question. All right, we've sent the link again to this applicant. So at least he's communicating to us. Hang on, let's. Crystal, does your husband do delivery? Because I don't live far from you. Like, right? Yeah. <laughs> so there's just a heads up. There's five items on the, uh, at least right now, on the um, April 22nd Planning Commission meeting. One of those items is an extension of a previous approval. So it's it's just like tonight. Um, or similar agendas to tonight. Um, but I, I guess part of it is if there's, if there are concerns with this proposal, I could I could see um, tabling it and getting it on the next agenda and we can work with the applicant and do more test runs with him on the software. Um, if there's not, I guess the question is, is there any reason to table it? Um, is there any new information that you think the applicant could add on this? So can I we just get a through. general sense from everyone if they've got serious concerns they want to hear from the applicant? I'm okay moving forward. Okay, the yeah. sense I'm getting is just based on nods for the record. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're we're willing to 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 move forward tonight, notwithstanding. You give it like a um, like a six of a ten. I I, <laughs> I I would like to make a motion, Madam Chairman. Great, thank you, Brenda. Um, uh, I'm going to make the motion to approve with conditions listed in the staff report, based on the information in the staff report. The information presented and the input received during the public hearing. I move that the planning commission approve the. Oh, excuse me, I'm on the wrong. I'm on the wrong. Um, the. <laughs> Sorry, Here we are. Okay, positive recommendation to city council based on the findings and analysis in the staff report. That's only in discussion at the public hearing. I move that the planning commission forward a positive recommendation to the city council for the proposed zoning map amendment file PLN PCM 2019-01086 proposed ch zone change from R1 R1 5000 single family residential district to RMF 35 moderate density multifamily residential and file PLN PCM 2019-01087 Proposed master plan amendment from low density residential to medium density residential. I'll second. Okay, right, we've got a motion by Sarah, a second by Amy. It's a we'll motion by Brenda. With, 
Oh, sorry. Motion by Brenda. <laughs> second by Amy. Just to get the record it's, straight. That's all. <laughs> I know. I know. I should know better. Um, let's start with Crystal. Yes. Sarah. Yes. Brenda. Yes. Matt. Yes. John. Yes. Amy. Yes. Maureen. Yes. All right, great. Unanimous motion passes. Okay. Um, seeing nothing else on the agenda, unless Nick, you have anything, any parting words of wisdom? Uh, I actually did want to thank everybody for bearing with us. Um, this went way smoother than I think we anticipated. Um, I was actually impressed that we had 30 something attendees um, <laughs> the meeting. So that went well. Um, if anybody has any feedback on ways to improve or uh, anything like that, don't hesitate to shoot us an email. And um, again, thank, thanks for everything. Uh, it's a crazy, crazy world. And somehow we managed to figure this part out. So thanks everyone. No, thank you. Thank you and staff for everything you've done to pull this off. It's nothing short of monumental. So with that, uh, we are adjourned. Thanks everyone. Good job guys. Thank you. Bye everybody.